Paleontology is the study of ancient life through remains left by the creatures that once roamed our lands millions of years ago. With the study of anything ancient, you can bet there's a bunch of weird and obscure theories out there. So that's exactly what we'll be covering today in this weird paleontology iceberg. This video will cover tier 1 since this chart is super long. Anyways without further ado, let's get into the video with the first entry. Plastic Dinosaurs Made From Dinosaurs This idea centers around the notion that plastic dinosaur toys contain elements or remnants of real dinosaurs. It's a pretty unusual thing to say, but it emerged from the association with fossil fuels and dinosaurs, while also being adopted by oil companies as marketing strategies in the early 1900s. Basically, the term fossil fuels likely lead to the assumption that they're directly related to the remains of ancient creatures like dinosaurs. And since synthetic plastic is made from crude oil, a type of fossil fuel, you can basically see where the link was created. However, the reality is that vast majority of oil and other fossil fuels originate from ancient microscopic marine life, such as phytoplankton and algae, rather than the remains of vertebrates, such as dinosaurs. Kenneth Lacavara, a well-known American paleontologist, also reinforces this fact in an online article I'll link down below by highlighting that the geological origins of oil fields, especially the ones supplying the bulk of the world's oil, do not align with the presence of dinosaurs. Hollow Earth the concept of hollow earth proposes that the earth is not a solid sphere but rather a shell-like structure with vast, habitable spaces within its interior. The idea has been supported by some speculative theories, mythologies, and fiction. Historical figures like Edmund Haley, known for Haley's Comet, wondered about the possibility of concentric shells within the earth. Proponents of the theory suggest that there might be entrances at the poles or various hidden passages that lead to the interior world. Interestingly enough, in this interior world, it's said that extinct creatures like the dinosaurs actually live and thrive within the hollow earth. However, this theory was more out there during the early days of geological inquiry, and nowadays it's more of a product of imaginative thinking and myth. Too Big to Walk The Too Big to Walk idea is about really huge dinosaurs, like Argentinosaurus, being so massive that they might have had trouble moving around easily. These dinosaurs were some of the biggest creatures ever, making scientists wonder how they walked around with such huge bodies. Some experts propose their size might have made it hard for them to move fast on land. Their idea is that these giants might have moved very slowly or found different ways to get around, like using water or other tricks to support their weight, meaning they'd be considered semi-aquatic animals. Although scientists are still learning how the animals moved by studying their bones and muscles, this theory is generally considered a fringe theory, but it still remains a fascinating topic in paleontology, so there's not really much about it. Dinosaurs are dragons during the early stages of saurian fossil discoveries, when paleontology was on its rise, the findings often shared a striking resemblance to the mythical creatures known as dragons. This led some to believe that the findings were mythical beasts from well-known folklore and legends due to their physical appearances. At that time, concepts such as geological time and the idea of extinction were not universally accepted or well understood, neither was the term dinosaur even coined. Therefore, it does make sense that people would have jumped to conclusions and let their mind wander about the possibilities of the fossil's origin. Also, some believe that the origin of dragons in historical myths and legends might have actually been inspired by encounters or interactions with ancient reptilian creatures, such as dinosaurs, which were thought to have lived concurrently with humans. Nowadays, this idea still persists within specific creationist circles. Creationism Creationism is a belief that asserts the universe, earth, and all life forms were created by a divine being, typically in line with religious texts such as the Bible's Genesis account in Christianity. It posits that a supernatural entity, often referred to as a god or higher power, deliberately designed and brought everything into existence. According to creationism, the origins of life and the diversity of living organisms are a result of a purposeful act by a creator rather than through natural processes such as evolution by natural selection. Creationists argue for a literal interpretation of religious texts, advocating that the earth and its life forms were created in a relatively short period typically a few thousand years, as opposed to the vast timescales suggested by scientific evidence. De-evolution De-evolution is a term that's sometimes used in discussions about evolution, but holds a different meaning than what one might expect. In scientific contexts, de-evolution is not a recognized or accepted concept within evolutionary biology. Evolution typically describes a process of species developing and changing over time to adapt to their environments or changing circumstances which is referred to as natural selection. However, outside of scientific circles, de-evolution is occasionally used to suggest a backward or regressive evolution, 
implying that organisms might actually revert to a simpler or less advanced form. There's this thing out there called tech de-evolution, which was pretty interesting to learn about. This idea essentially contradicts the basic principles of evolutionary biology, which emphasize adaption and the diversification of species over time. Therefore, it's generally considered to be based on a misunderstanding of how evolution actually works. Orthogenesis Chain of Being Orthogenesis, also known as straight line evolution, was a hypothesis prevalent during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, suggesting that species have an inherent tendency to evolve in a predetermined direction. During the Victorian era, when Charles Darwin introduced the theory of evolution, it clashed with prevailing religious and societal views. Darwin's proposition that humans shared a common ancestry with other earthly creatures challenged the notion of humans as divinely ordained superior beings, so you can see how we would have gotten a lot of backlash for it. Proponents believed that evolutionary changes were guided by an internal force or predetermined path within organisms rather than solely driven by natural selection or environmental influences. Darwin himself was aware of the potential for his theory to be misconstructed as applying a linear progression toward human superiority. He famously described evolution not as a linear tree with humans at its apex, but rather as a radiating bush, emphasizing that humans are just one branch among many in the evolutionary process. Mythical Beasts Based on Early Fossil Finds The concept that ancient mythologies and folklore might have been influenced by early encounters with fossil remains has been suggested in various forms throughout history. This idea has gained traction in recent times with some scholars proposing connections between ancient myths and actual fossil discoveries. One such example comes from Adrian Meyer, an archaeologist, who suggested that certain mythical creatures, like griffins, might have originated from encounters with protoceratops skeletons. Meyer theorized that ancient peoples might have come across the skeletal remains of protoceratops, a dinosaur with a beak-like structure, and incorporated them into their legends of griffins. However, while this idea has garnered attention and interest, it has faced criticism and skepticism from other scholars. Anthropologists like Langford and paleontologist Mark Witten have raised serious concerns and identified flaws in Mayer's argument regarding the association between Proceratops and Griffins. Ica Stones The Ica Stones are a set of andesite stones that were discovered in the Ica province of Peru in the 1960s by Basilio Ostuya. These stones are notable for allegedly bearing shallow engravings depicting scenes of ancient humans hunting and interacting with dinosaurs, as well as illustrations of advanced technology like telescopes and flying machines. Despite the initial fascination surrounding these stones, investigations at Skurini have revealed them to be forgeries. Basilo Utsia, the individual who claimed to have discovered and carved these stones, later admitted to creating them himself. The gravings on the stones, including depiction of dinosaurs coexisting with humans and technological advancements, were revealed to be modern fabrications rather than genuine ancient artifacts. Despite their proven inauthenticity, the Ica stones have persisted as a subject of interest for certain groups, notably among proponents of creationism and ancient astronaut theories. Advocates of these ideas have used the Ica stones as perpetrated evidence of an advanced civilization that coexisted with dinosaurs, suggesting that these engravings validate their beliefs. Piltdown Man The Piltdown Man refers to an infamous archaeological hoax that took place in the early 20th century. In 1912, fragments of a skull and jawbone were discovered in Piltdown, East Sussex, England, purportedly presenting a huge missing link between apes and humans. This find was hailed as a groundbreaking discovery, suggesting the existence of an ancient human ancestor with a large brain case and ape-like jaw. For several decades, the Piltdown Man was considered a crucial piece of evidence in the study of human evolution. However, in the 1950s, extensive scientific scrutiny revealed that the Piltdown Man was a forgery. Chemical analysis and detailed examinations exposed that the skull fragments were from a comparatively recent human skull, while the jaw mode belonged to an orangutan. These bones were deliberately stained and manipulated to appear ancient, fooling scientists and experts for many years. Chickenosaurus Paleontologist Jack Horner has been spearheading a project aimed at genetically modifying chicken embryos to exhibit dinosaur-like traits by manipulating certain genes associated with dinosaur characteristics. It's kind of like Jurassic Park but with a chicken. The idea stems from the evolutionary link between birds and dinosaurs, since birds are considered descendants of dinosaurs based on fossil evidence and shared characteristics. Horner's endeavor has attracted attention due to its ambitious goal of reverse engineering features of dinosaurs from modern bird embryos. Although there have been claims of limited success within this project, 
such as experiments resulting in chicken embryos exhibiting skull characteristics of certain dinosaur species, like the Velociraptor, many within the paleontological community remain skeptical about the project's scientific merit and feasibility. Critics argue that even if Homer's experiments were successful in producing chicken embryos with altered features resembling certain aspects of dinosaurs, it wouldn't actually result in any resurrection of dinosaurs, so there probably won't be any chicken dinosaurs running around for a while. Neodinosaurs In the context of cryptozoology, neodinosaurs refer to claims or belief that certain non-avian dinosaurs, presumed to be extinct for millions of years, might somehow still exist in remote or unexplored regions of the world. One such example is the case of Mokele Membe, a creature often sighted in the folklore of Central Africa, particularly in the Congo region. Mokelo Membe is described in local legends as a large, semi-aquatic creature resembling a sauropod dinosaur, with traits similar to those of prehistoric dinosaurs like the long-necked sauropods. Cryptozoologists and some explorers have hypothesized that Mokelo Membe, if it exists, might represent a surviving population of dinosaurs, specifically sauropods, thought to have gone extinct millions of years ago. These claims are based on anecdotal accounts though, folklore, and alleged sightings by locals and explorers though so they lack substantial scientific evidence. It's kind of like the Loch Ness Monster and Nessie, where there's a lot of accounts but there's no actual real evidence out there. Therefore, the existence of living non-avian dinosaurs, such as Mokele Membe or other similar cryptids, remains speculative. But just imagining if something like that is actually out there though is terrifying considering the size of those things. Poloxy Tracks The Poloxy River Tracks refer to a set of alleged fossilized footprints found along the Poloxy River in Texas, USA. These tracks gained attention due to claims that they provided evidence of both humans and dinosaurs coexisting, seemingly contradicting the widely accepted understanding of the fossil record. Initially, some individuals suggested that certain prints within the trackway resembled human footprints alongside larger tracks presumed to be those of dinosaurs. This concept became a focal point for those advocating the idea of young earth creationism, which again proposes a literal interpretation of the Bible's account for creation. However, upon further examination and extensive scientific evidence, many of the tracks initially believed to be human footprints were re-evaluated and determined to be misinterpretations or erosional features that resembled human-like shapes. Human self-domestication Human self-domestication is a hypothesis proposing that humans, through social and evolutionary processes, have undergone self-directed selection similar to the domestication of animals. This idea suggests that over the course of human evolution, certain behavioral and physical traits emerged or were reinforced through societal pressures linked to changes that parallel those in domesticated animals. Basically, it suggests that as humans transition from hunter-gatherer societies to more settled agricultural communities, living together in larger groups became more advantageous. This meant that humans would have reduced their reactive aggression, increased cooperation, and changes in physical appearance for the overall benefit. Supporters of the self-domestication hypotheses point to evidence such as the reduction in cranial size, changes in skeletal features, and alterations in brain structures over the course of human evolution. They argue that these changes might be analogous to those observed in domesticated animals compared to their more wild ancestors. Cavemen coexisted with dinosaurs The idea that cavemen coexisted with dinosaurs is a misconception or an inaccurate belief. According to established scientific evidence from paleontology, the existence of dinosaurs predates the appearance of modern humans by millions of years. Dinosaurs, which lived during the Mesozoic era, became extinct around 65 million years ago, long before the emergence of Homo sapiens. The term caveman generally refers to early humans, such as Neanderthals or other prehistoric human ancestors who lived during the Stone Age. These early human species evolved much later, appearing tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years ago, which is still significantly after the extinction of dinosaurs. When you really think about the timeline of events, it's actually pretty scary knowing the gap between humans and dinosaurs is so large. Overall, claims suggesting that cavemen and dinosaurs coexisted are often propagated in popular culture or certain pseudoscientific ideas, but we definitely know it's a misconception. All vertebrates are fish. This idea, or more commonly known as like a joke, emphasizes that cladistically speaking, the traits defining a specific group are also present in all its descendants, technically labeling them as fish. As vertebrates evolved from fish-like ancestors, they retained certain fundamental characteristics that trace back to their fish origins, even though they've evolved and diversified into distinct lineages with unique adaptions. 
but you can see how this categorization doesn't actually reflect the practical or everyday classification of animals. In scientific terms, while humans and other vertebrates share a common evolutionary lineage with fish, they've also undergone a bunch of evolutionary changes that differentiate them from their fish ancestors. Classifying humans or other vertebrates as fish just isn't that useful for understanding their biology, behavior, or ecological roles. Lemuria Lemuria is a concept that emerged in the 19th century about a hypothetical lost continent. It was envisioned as a sunken landmass that might have existed in the Indian or Pacific Ocean and became associated with the origin of humanity. Ernest Haeckel, a prominent biologist and philosopher, suggested Lemuria as a possible ancient land where lemurs, considered among the closest relatives of humans at that time, might have originated. Some proponents of this concept, including certain occult groups, also developed narratives and mystical beliefs about Lemuria, linking it to human evolution from primordial forms to more complex beings. The belief in Lemurian origins has still persisted, particularly in West Tamil cultural histories, contributing to local folklore and narratives about a lost ancient land. If anyone is interested, there's also a great book out there called The Lost Land of Lemuria that more dwells into the history and cultural significance of the Lemuria concept. I'll link it down if anyone's interested in actually learning about it. Baramint Baramint is a term introduced by Frank Lewis Marsh, a seven-day Adventist biologist. In the context of creationism, specifically young earth creationism, a baramin refers to the concept of created kinds. According to Marsh's belief, baramins represent the original categories or types of organisms created by God. Within these baramins, Marsh proposed that microevolutionary changes could occur, but insisted that they wouldn't lead to the emergence of entirely new species, meaning this would be completely different of what we know of evolution from Darwin. Advocates of the Baramin concept argue that each kind or Baramin represents a distinct group of organisms created by God and serves as the fundamental unit of biological diversity. The concept of Baramins is associated with the rejection of the broader concept of evolution and the idea of common descent. It suggests that while variation occurs within Baramins, the boundaries of these kinds are fixed and prevent one kind from evolving into another over long periods. Abiogenesis Abiogenesis is a theory that proposes life came from non-living matter. It refers to the hypothetical phenomenon where simple organic molecules under certain conditions on early earth gradually assembled and formed increasingly complex structures, eventually leading to the emergence of the first living organisms. This concept suggests that the transition from inanimate matter to living organisms occurred over an extended period through a series of chemical reactions and molecular interactions. Scientists hypothesize that the conditions on early earth such as a reducing atmosphere, energy sources like lightning or geothermal activities, and the presence of certain organic compounds might have facilitated the formation of complex organic molecules, such as amino acids and nucleotides. These building blocks of life, once formed, might have further combined and organized themselves into more complex structures like proteins, RNA, and ultimately the first self-replicating entities representing the earliest forms of life and then coming to where we are today as humans. Prehistoric Volcanism In vintage paleontological illustrations, a prevalent theme depicted frequent and intense volcanic activity during prehistoric times. This artistic portrayal often featured erupting volcanoes as a prominent backdrop to ancient landscapes. The idea behind this trope was rooted in the perception that volcanic eruptions were more frequent and extreme in prehistory compared to contemporary times. Artists and early scientists believed that these volcanic eruptions were a common occurrence and had a significant impact on the ancient environment. This depiction aimed to capture the dramatic and dynamic nature of the Earth's past, showcasing erupting volcanoes as a regular element in the ancient landscapes within paleontological reconstructions. However, now contemporary scientific understanding suggests a more nuanced view of past volcanic activity, recognizing different variations and complexities in the activity behaviors of eruptions throughout Earth's history, which basically means it's an antiquated theory now. Microtrips and Fossils this entry comes from the viral image in 2014, claiming to depict a 250 million year old fossilized microtrip found by a fisherman in Russia. The image, widely circulated online, led to speculations and sensational claims about the discovery of ancient technological artifacts embedded within fossils. However, upon closer scrutiny by experts in paleontology and geology, it was determined that the supposed fossilized microchip was in fact a misidentified or misrepresented natural object. The image actually depicted a fragment of a crinoid, a marine animal related to starfish and sea urchins, rather than a technological artifact. 
Also, there have been occasional unfounded rumors or claims suggesting the discovery of dinosaur bones embedded with microchips or other technological devices within the same rock matrix. Such claims lack credible evidence and are often rooted in misunderstandings, misinterpretations, or deliberate hoaxes rather than genuine scientific discoveries. Panspermia Panspermia is a scientific hypothesis proposing that life or the organic building blocks necessary for life's emergence might have originated somewhere else in the universe and then spread to Earth or other celestial bodies through comets, meteorites, or other space debris. According to the hypothesis, organic molecules or even simple life forms such as bacteria or microbial organisms could have survived space travel within rocks, debris, or protective materials of celestial bodies. These materials could have then potentially reached Earth's surface, delivering the necessary ingredients for life or even primitive life forms. While panspermia offers an intriguing possibility for the origin of life, it's important to note that it's still a hypothesis and still hasn't been definitely proven. The concept raises questions about the conditions required for survival of life or organic compounds during interstellar travel, the likelihood of their arrival on Earth, and their potential role in the emergence of life on our planet. Smithsonian Suppression The Smithsonian Suppression conspiracy theory is widely circulated among groups such as creationists and cryptozoologists. This theory asserts that the Smithsonian Institution is deliberately concealing fossil discoveries that would contradict the accepted understanding of evolutionary history. Proponents of this theory claim that the Smithsonian actively suppresses evidence that includes giant human skeletons, contemporary dinosaur remains, and indications of highly developed ancient civilizations. However, the Smithsonian Institution, like other reputable scientific organizations, has to operate under rigorous standards of evidence and peer-reviewed research. So, if they find something that lacks substantial verifiable evidence, they aren't allowed to accept it as valid scientific discoveries. So, while there's no actual documented credible evidence that the Smithsonian actively suppresses discoveries, it still remains a conspiracy theory out there. Mitochondrial Eve Mitochondrial Eve is a term used in genetics to refer to the most recent common matrilineal ancestor of all living humans. This concept traces back through our matrilineal lineage to a woman who lived in ancient times. Mitochondrial DNA, passed exclusively from mother to offspring, allows scientists to trace ancestry and estimate when this common ancestor might have lived. However, the term mitochondrial Eve often leads to misconceptions or misinterpretations. Some people mistake it to mean that this woman was the only living human female at the time, akin to the first woman as described in religious creation stories such as the Genesis account of Eden. This misconception is incorrect though, because in reality, mitochondrial Eve lived thousands of years ago, not in isolation, but as part of a larger population. She was not the only woman alive during the time, but rather the only woman whose matrilineal line has continued unbroken to the present day in all living humans. Her contemporaries had descendants too, but their maternal lines eventually ceased to continue over generations, while mitochondrial Eve's line persisted. Dinosauroid The dinosauroid concept proposed by Dale A. Russell in 1982 involve the hypothetical post-Cretaceous ancestor from Stenonychosaurus, an extinct dinosaur species. Russell's thought experiment imagined a scenario where this dinosaur ancestor evolved intelligence similar to that of humans, leading to a humanoid-like body plan. Russell's speculation envisioned a creature that would potentially develop a more upright posture, lose much of its tail, gain opposable thumbs, and have a flatter, rounder face. This concept created a vivid and striking image in popular culture captivating the imagination of many, but also evoking criticism for projecting human-like characteristics onto a dinosaur. It was due to this anthropomorphic bias, which suggested that intelligence or tool-making capabilities would lead to a humanoid body plan that caused it to receive the most criticism. Over time, as studies into animal cognition, particularly among dinosaurs' closest living relatives, birds, have become more known, it has become apparent that intelligence and complex behaviors do not necessitate a human-like body plan. Geofacts Geofacts represent natural geological formations that bear a striking resemblance to human-made artifacts, making them challenging to differentiate from ancient human tools or objects. Within the realm of paleoanthropology, the identification of these geofacts becomes crucial as they often blur the line between what might actually be occurring formations and intentionally crafted items by early humans. Numerous instances of some of the oldest claimed human artifacts have faced debates and challenges to their potential classification as geofacts. Particularly, certain iconic examples like the Venus of Birkith Ram and the Venus of Tantan, both thought to be early human figures created by ancient people 
have sparked controversies in the scientific community. These figurines as interpretations as deliberate creations by early humans are contested due to the possibility that they might be natural geological formations, complicating the understanding of early human artistry and cultural development. The distinction between geofacts and intentionally crafted artifacts remains a significant challenge in archaeological and anthropological studies, influencing our understanding of human evolution and cultural origins. Marsupial Monotreme Pterosaurs Edward Newman, a naturalist and publisher, proposed a theory in 1843 that pterosaurs, a group of prehistoric flying reptiles, were not reptiles but marsupial bats. This theory was based on the observation of tufts or hair in pterosaurs' fossils, which suggested that these creatures were not typical cold-blooded reptiles but warm-blooded, hairy animals. Newman's theory was a significant departure from the prevailing theories of the time, which were largely influenced by the renowned French naturalist Georges Cuvier who had described the idea of similarities between bats and pterosaurs. Newman's theory was considered groundbreaking, as it was the first to depict pterosaurs as warm-blooded, hairy creatures. His reconstruction of pterosaurs showed them as resembling flying marsupials, a group of mammals known to be of ancient origin. Newman's theory was also influenced by the work of German naturalist Samuel Thomas von Sumering, who had previously noted similarities between bats and pterosaurs. Martin Rieschus has indeed suggested that pterosaurs were warm-blooded creatures, validating aspects of Newman's theory. However, it's important to note that while Newman's theory was innovated for its time, it is not supported by current scientific consensus, which classifies pterosaurs as reptiles and not mammals. Japanese Paleolithic Hoax The Japanese Paleolithic hoax involving Shinji Fujimura, a prominent archaeological specializing in prehistoric Japanese culture, came to light in the year 2000, revealing a shocking revelation. Fujimura was found to have fabricated the majority of his archaeological discoveries over a significant period spanning from at least 1981 and encompassing around 140 dig sites. These falsified finds had a substantial impact on the field of Japanese archaeology and paleontology, as many of Fujimura's purported discoveries were central to understanding Japan's ancient history. The extent and longevity of this fraudulent scheme exposed significant deficiencies in the academic standards of Japanese archaeology. Fujimura's forgeries prompted a critical reevaluation of existing practices and methodologies within the field. The reliance on his findings necessitated a substantial overhaul of Japanese Paleolithic studies, highlighting the need for more rigorous scrutiny and verification process in archaeological research. Fujimura later himself provided an unusual explanation for his actions, claiming he was motivated by desire for recognition as the man who discovered the oldest stoneware in Japan. He also made peculiar assertions, suggesting that he was influenced or possessed by a demon attributing his actions to supernatural forces. Omphalos Hypotheses The Omphalos Hypotheses, formulated by the naturalist and Christian theologian Philip Henry Gose in 1857, posits a unique perspective on the evidence of evolution found in the fossil record. Gose proposed that God, in the act of creation, intentionally designed the world with a pre-existing history, including the appearance of an evolutionary timeline evident in fossils. The term Omphalos refers to the belief that Adam and Eve despite not having umbilical cords due to their creation by God, would have had belly buttons, analogous to the concept of an apparent evolutionary history within fossils. This hypothesis suggests that the evidence of evolution seen in the fossil record did not represent a real historical sequence of life forms evolving over time. Instead, he argued that God deliberately created the world with the appearance of age and development, including fossil evidence, to give it an appearance of continuity and history. However, the Omphalos hypothesis face significant criticism and skepticism from both scientific and Christian communities. Scientifically, it contradicted the established understanding of evolution and the geological history supported by empirical evidence. Dinosaur Tissue Claims The interests and counterclaims regarding the discovery of soft tissue remnants within fossilized dinosaur bones have sparked controversy within the fields of paleontology. Mary Schweitzer, a paleontologist, gained attention for her assertions of discovering possible blood cells within a Tyrannosaurus rex bone. Schweitzer's findings were initially met with skepticism and controversy due to the unconventional nature of the claims. The idea of soft tissue surviving for tens of millions of years contradicted the established understanding that organic materials decay rapidly over time. Additionally, her methodology involved breaking open or using acid to access the internal structures of the fossils which raised concerns about the potential for contamination or altercation of the specimens. However, subsequent research by Schweitzer and other scientists uncovered additional instances of potential soft tissue preservation in various fossilized dinosaur bones. 
These discoveries, while still controversial, included findings such as structures resembling blood vessels, cells, and proteins that, that appeared to be remarkably well preserved within the ancient bones. Cope's Rule Cope's Rule, named after the American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope, is a concept that describes the tendency for organisms and evolving lineages to increase in size over time. In simpler terms, it's like saying that over the course of evolution, animals have a tendency to get bigger. This trend has been observed in the fossil records, with examples such as the increase in body size in the lineage of modern horses over the last 60 million years. We've seen that, in many cases, as a species evolves, its members tend to get larger. However, it's important to note that Cope's rule may not apply to all groups of organisms, and there are exceptions to this trend. Think about something like the giant sloth and the sloth today, you know, it's a considerable difference. Scientists are still trying to figure out why this pattern occurs, and what factors might influence it. So, while Cope's rule is a useful concept for understanding the history of life on Earth, it's not a hard and fast rule, and there's still a lot we don't know about it. Reptoid Serpent Cult The concept of reptoids, or serpent cults, proposes a theory suggesting a unified root religion in ancient times that revered a superior race of reptilian beings. This theory has gained recent popularity, particularly through the works of conspiracy theorists such as David Icke. Proponents of this theory claim that ancient serpent cults found across different civilizations throughout history were interconnected and worshipped a prehistoric race of reptilian entities. These beings are often described as advanced or extraterrestrial species, sometimes referred to as reptoids or reptilian humanoids, possessing shape-shifting abilities and exerting control over humanity from behind the scenes. David Icke, among others, has popularized these ideas, suggesting that these reptilian beings are the hidden rulers of the world, manipulating society and influencing world events for their own agenda. Icke's works often combine elements of conspiracy theories, alternative history, and new age beliefs, proposing a narrative where a secret elite supposedly descended from these reptilian entities, control global affairs, and suppress humanity's true potential. Michael Kremel Michael Kremel is an author known for his book Forbidden Archaeology, which presents unconventional perspectives on human history and archaeology. In his book, Kremel challenges the mainstream scientific view of human origins by proposing that anatomically modern humans might have existed on Earth for an immensely extended period, dating back as far as 2.8 billion years ago, which is a long time. Kremel's ideas are distinct from traditional creationist literature in that they are influenced by a Hindu Vedic perspective. He argues that evidence of human presence in ancient geological strata contradicts the commonly accepted timeline of human evolution, proposed by mainstream science. Kremel suggests that there have been advanced civilizations and ancient beings in human form on Earth for far longer than conventional archaeological and anthropological findings suggest. The book Forbidden Archaeology presents a compilation of purported archaeological anomalies and controversial artifacts that, according to Kremel, challenge the conventional understanding of human history. These anomalies, as outlined by Kremel, include alleged discoveries of human artifacts found in geological layers far older than currently accepted by mainstream science. Dinosaur Mating Mystery The mating behavior of large dinosaurs, particularly those with massive size and distinctive anatomical features like spikes or plates, remain a topic of scientific speculation and curiosity in paleontology. For some of the immensely huge quadrupedal dinosaurs, such as Stegosaurus, the mechanics of how these large creatures made it pose intriguing questions. The presence of defensive or ornamental structures like spikes, plates, or horns on certain dinosaur species adds complexity to understanding their mating behavior. Such features could potentially hinder or complicate the mating process, leading to speculation and varying hypotheses among paleontologists. Given the limited direct evidence available in fossil records concerning dinosaur behavior, scientists rely on indirect clues, comparative anatomy, and biomechanical studies to propose theories about dinosaur mating. Speculation on the mating behavior of large dinosaurs include hypotheses about mating rituals, possible courtship displays, and how these massive creatures could have physically maneuvered to mate. Giant Spiders and Carboniferous The freshwater Europterid Megarachne was initially misidentified as a giant spider during the late Carboniferous period. The confusion arose due to incomplete fossil evidence and a misinterpretation of its anatomy. Originally believed to be a colossal spider with an estimated lifespan of approximately 50 centimeters, Megarachne was thought to be the largest spider-like creature ever known. I couldn't imagine ever seeing one of those things in real life. However, further research and re-examination of the fossils later revealed that Megarachne was not a spider, but a type of Europteroid, an extinct group of aquatic arthropods 
commonly known as sea scorpions. The initial misidentification led to a misconception that giant spiders once roamed the Carboniferous landscapes, haunting the era with their exaggerated large size. Vintage paleo art from that period often depicted the Carboniferous as a time inhabited by enormous spiders, influenced by the initial misinterpretation of Megarachne as a spider-like creature. These illustrations portrayed these spiders as significantly larger than any known spiders, emphasizing the imagined frightful and monstrous aspect of these creatures. Fire-breathing Parasolorophus The claim regarding Parasolorophus possessing a fire-breathing capability proposed by creationist Duan T. Gish is not really supported by scientific evidence, even though it seems super cool and I wish it was true. Parasolorophus, a herbivorous dinosaur with a distinctive elaborate cranial crest, had a hollow tube-like structure extending from its skull. This crest is believed to have had various functions including vocalization, regulating body temperature, or display during mating or social interactions. However, the notion of this structure being a mixing chamber for flammable materials and enabling fire-breathing abilities in Parasolorophus is not substantiated by scientific research or paleontological evidence. Gish's hypothesis was that Parasolorophus would use his cranial crest to spew flammable materials like a dragon for defense against predators. This proposal is considered highly speculative and lacking imperial evidence, but it does make really cool art. Oort Cloud the Oort Cloud is a hypothetical region of space that is believed to exist in the outermost region of our solar system. It's thought to be a vast and diffuse shell or cloud composed of icy objects such as comets, remnants from the early formation of the solar system. The Oort Cloud, if it exists, is located much farther from the Sun than the distant Kuiper Belt, extending thousands of astronomical units away from the Sun. In the 1980s, scientists proposed the idea that mass extinctions on Earth occurred in regular intervals approximately every 26 million years. This theory prompted speculation about a hypothetical companion star to the Sun, known as Nemesis. It was suggested that Nemesis, in its orbit around the Sun, could pass through the Oort cloud at these intervals, disturbing the comets and causing them to rain down on Earth, potentially triggering mass extinctions like the one that happened to the dinosaurs. However, over time, further research and data analysis have led to doubts about the existence of Nemesis and the hypotheses of regular, periodic mass extinctions. Studies on the timing of extinctions have revealed inconsistencies in the supposed regularity of extinction events occurring every 26 million years. Haeckel Ernest Haeckel was a prominent and influential figure in the fields of embryology, zoology, and evolutionary biology during the 19th and early 20th centuries. He was a German naturalist and scientist known for his contributions to the understanding of evolution and embryonic development. Haeckel's ideas, while influential and groundbreaking in many aspects, were also associated with several controversial and disproven concepts. One of Haeckel's most famous Byronist theories was the concept of anatogeny recapitulates phylogeny, suggesting that an organism embryonic development retraces the evolutionary stages of its species. This idea proposed that the successive stages of an embryo represent ancestral forms from earlier evolutionary stages. However, this theory has been widely discredited in modern biology as an oversimplified and inaccurate as embryonic development does not precisely mirror an organism's evolutionary history. Haeckel's work encompassed not only scientific contributions, but also controversial ideas and theories that linked him to eugenics and scientific racism. His theories on polygenism, a discredited notion asserting different human races evolved from separate ancestral lines, and his views on racial hierarchies aligned with eugenist thought made his work appealing to groups like Nazi sympathizers. Moreover, Haeckel's support for a crystalline origin of life Proposing that life originated from a simple crystal-like forms was another concept that did not withstand scientific scrutiny as not accepted in the contemporary biology. Pseudofossils Pseudofossils are geological formations or structures that bear a resemblance to fossils but lack any organic origin or biological basis. These formations often resemble the shapes, patterns, or structures seen in genuine fossils, leading to confusion or misidentification by observers unfamiliar with geological processes. One example of a pseudofossil is Eozoan candesem, which initially interpreted as the remains of ancient marine organisms. It was thought to be fossilized remains of primitive single-celled organisms, resembling the cellular structures of Foraminifera, but further investigation revealed that Eozoan candesem was actually a mineral structure formed through geological processes rather than a biological fossil. Paleodictyon is another geological structure that has sometimes been mistaken for fossils. These hexagonal patterns found on certain seafloor settlements were initially thought to be the fossilized burrows of unknown ancient organisms.
However, studies later indicated that these patterns were likely created through non-biological processes, possibly related to sedimentary structures formed by natural forces such as currents or chemical precipitation. Ceratopsians had no frills. The traditional depiction of ceratopsian dinosaurs often includes elaborate fills, bony structures extending from the back of their skulls. However, an alternate reconstruction proposed in John McLaughlin's text, Archosauria, challenges this conventional representation. McLaughlin's hypothesis suggests that ceratopsians didn't possess frills in the typical sense, but instead had muscular integuments extending from the skull base, resembling a bison-like hump. According to this alternative reconstruction, the so-called frills of ceratopsians were reinterpreted as the attachment sites for extensive muscular structures. Instead of displaying a broad bony frill, these dancers might have had thickened areas of muscles or soft tissues that originated from the back of their skulls. These muscular structures would have extended outward and backward, creating a profile reminiscent of a bison's hump. Essentially, McLaughlin's proposal challenged the prevailing depiction of ceratopsians, offering a different perspective on the function and appearance of their cranial features. But it's still just a hypothesis though, and still hasn't really gained widespread acceptance among paleontologists. David Peters David Peters is known for his involvement in paleontological artwork, his website reptileevolution.com, and his controversial reconstructions of prehistoric creatures, particularly pterosaurs. Peters' work includes creating radical and unconventional reconstructions of pterosaurs by using a method that involves tracing scanned images of fossils with a direct access to the original specimens. This approach has sparked controversy within the paleontological community due to its divergence from traditional scientific methods that rely on direct examinations of fossil specimens. Peters has proposed significant revisions to the reptile family tree, suggesting unconventional evolutionary lineages such as a direct connection between Triassic gilding reptiles like Longus squama and pterosaurs. Additionally, he claims to have identified a new and exotic species, including incredibly small insect-sized pterosaurs. However, many of these proposed discoveries have faced criticism and skepticism from the scientific community with concerns raised about misinterpretation of digital artifacts present in the images he uses. Also, Peters does not have an institutional platform or academic affiliation supporting his unconventional ideas, unlike other figures in paleontology such as Jack Horner or Alan Fiducia. T-Rex was a scavenger. Jack Horner, a name we just mentioned and also in Tier 1, proposed an intriguing but controversial theory suggesting that Tyrannosaurus rex might have functioned primarily as a scavenger rather than an active predator. Horner's hypothesis challenged the prevailing view of T. rex as a fearsome apex predator, suggesting that instead it adopted a scavenging lifestyle similar to vultures, predominantly feeding on already deceased animals. However, this notion faced skepticism within the scientific community. The prevailing consensus is that T. rex was indeed an apex predator, equipped with formidable features such as powerful jaws and sharp teeth, indicating its capability to actively hunt and capture live prey. While it's accepted that T-Rex likely engaged in opportunistic scavenging as observed in many modern large carnivores, the overarching understanding remains that it was a dominant predator in its ecosystem. Additionally, Homer subsequently revised his original hypothesis, clarifying that it was more of a thought experiment rather than a firmly supported and substantiated theory. Tully Monster Tully Monstrum, commonly referred to as the Tully Monster, is a mysterious creature from the Carboniferous period that interests scientists due to its peculiar anatomy and unclear classification. This intriguing animal possesses a unique body structure unlike any other known creature in the fossil record. Preserved fossils depict a soft body organism with a resemblance to a fish, featuring a tubular body and a distinctive appendage resembling a stiff, jointed proboscis near its mouth, which ends in a pincer-like structure. Despite numerous scientific investigations spanning nearly a century, the Tully monster's taxonomic placement remains a persistent mystery. Researchers have proposed various hypotheses, ranging from considering it as a basal vertebrate, mollusk, conodont, or arthropod, to even suggesting it might represent a late surviving branch of Cambrian fauna. Still though, this animal continues to confound experts, remaining an enduring puzzle within paleontology despite decades of intense research and scrutiny. Oop Arts Oop Art, an abbreviation for Out of Place Artifact, indicates instances where purportedly human-made objects are discovered within geological layers significantly predating human existence. These artifacts, according to some claims, challenge conventional timelines and suggest human presence or technological advancement during periods far earlier than currently accepted by scientific consensus. Examples of oop arts include allegedly anomalous discoveries such as metal objects, 
tools, or artifacts found in geological strata date to a time when humans were not believed to have existed. Despite their intriguing nature, these artifacts are often met with skepticism, as they typically lack concrete scientific verification and raise questions about their geological context and authenticity. Many of these instances have been debunked or found to be misinterpretations of geological processes, or modern objects mistakenly mixed in with an ancient strata. Caterpillars killed the dinosaurs. Stanley Flanders, an entomologist, proposed an intriguing theory in 1962 suggesting a possible role of caterpillars in the extinction of dinosaurs. Flanders hypothesized that the emergence of flowering plants, an event thought to have occurred during the Cretaceous period, led to the evolution of butterflies and their larvae, commonly known as the caterpillars. According to his theory, the sudden increase in caterpillar populations could have posed a challenge to the existing ecosystem by heavily consuming the newly evolved flowering plants. This consumption might have affected the available food sources for herbivorous dinosaurs and other creatures, potentially contributing to their decline like a domino effect in the food chain. However, this theory still remains speculative and largely hypothetical. As we know, the extinction of dinosaurs is considered a multifaceted event with various contributing factors including asteroid impacts, volcanic activity, climate changes, and ecological imbalances. While Flanders' theory offers an interesting perspective, it lacks comprehensive empirical evidence to substantiate it. Nemesis Star The Nemesis Star hypothesis, proposed in the 1980s, suggests the existence of a companion star to the sun, hypothesized to be a dim red or brown dwarf. The idea stemmed from a recognized periodicity in mass extinction events on Earth, specifically the proposal that Earth's mass extinctions occurred in cycles of approximately 26 million years. This led some scientists to speculate that a companion star, dubbed Nemesis, might have an elongated orbit that occasionally disrupts the Oort cloud, like we mentioned in Tier 1, sending comets or asteroids hurtling towards Earth. The concept posited that these cosmic disturbances caused by Nemesis might trigger catastrophic events like asteroid impacts, possibly contributing to mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. However, despite the initial interest in the Nemesis star hypothesis, Subsequent research and observations have found little evidence supporting the existence of such a celestial body. It's not that it's disproven, but rather scientists haven't discovered any conclusive proof or its associated impacts on Earth's biosphere. Also, the purported regularity of mass extinctions every 26 million years has been challenged, as the timing of events appears more irregular upon further analysis. Taurosaurus is Triceratops. The hypothesis proposed by Jack Horner in 2010 suggesting that Taurosaurus and Triceratops represent the same species has generated substantial debate within the field of Ceratopsian dinosaur studies. Horner postulated that Taurosaurus, known for his distinctive frill with large openings, was simply the mature form of the more widely recognized Triceratops, proposing that Triceratops specimens were juvenile representations of Taurosaurus. Central to this theory was the idea that the apparent differences between Taurosaurus and Triceratops, particularly in their frill structures, were indicative of an ontogenic transformation, meaning changes occurring as the dinosaur aged. Horner argued that the holes in the frill of Taurosaurus closed up as the animal matured into Triceratops. However, some researchers highlighted notable dissimilarities between Taurosaurus and Triceratops, including variations in skull shapes, horn curvature, and the distinct frill features. Critics argued that the differences observed were more consistent with the classification of Taurosaurus and Triceratops as separate species within the Ceratopsian family rather than different life stages of a single species. Human Hypercarnivore The idea of early humans as obligate carnivores or hyperpredators is a debated concept within human evolution. Whilst Jenner accepted that early humans were omnivores capable of consuming both animal and plant-based foods, there's no consensus that they were strictly hypercarnivores. The hypothesis proposed that hunting and consuming meat, particularly from large animals, played a pivotal role in human evolution, contributing to the development of human intelligence and culture. Advocates of this theory, such as Mickey Bendor and Ran Barkai, suggest that the high intake of animal protein, especially from hunting megafauna, provided essential nutrients that influenced both brain development and the evolution of human cognitive abilities. Despite that though, while archaeological evidence shows that early humans did consume meat and engage in hunting activities, there's ongoing debate about the proportion of meat in their diet and its direct impact on human evolution. Other factors such as tool use, social interaction, and environmental adaptions also play significant roles in shaping human evolution and the development of intelligence and culture. Further research and analysis are needed to fully understand early human diets and their relationship to evolutionary processes. Calvary's Skull 
The calvary skull refers to a purported discovery of a human skull found in the Pilocene Age rock formations of Calvers County, California during the 19th century. It gained attention as it seemed to suggest that humans had been present in North America far earlier than previously proposed. However, this finding was eventually revealed to be a hoax. The skull was discovered in 1866 by miners who claimed to have unearthed it from deep layers of geological strata. It was initially considered a remarkable discovery challenging the existing understanding of human history in North America. However, subsequent analysis and research indicated that the skull was actually of recent origin, likely planted or placed in the Pilcine rock layers by unknown individuals to deceive and generate controversy. Maybe kind of like a prank. Despite being debunked and identified as a hoax though by the scientific community, the Calvary skull occasionally resurfaces in discussions, particularly among creationists who attempt to present it as evidence against established geological and archaeological timelines. Nano Tyrannus Nano Tyrannus is an intriguing and controversial dinosaur species that has been the subject of intense debate in paleontology. Initially identified as a separate genus, it was proposed to be a smaller and distinct cousin of T. rex. Discovered in the late 20th century, the fossils attributed to Nano Tyrannus consisted of specimens featuring smaller body size and different anatomical characteristics than that of T. rex. However, scientific analysis and detailed examination of the Nanotyrannus fossils, particularly a skull morphology, growth patterns, and bone structure, have led to a prevailing consensus among paleontologists that Nanotyrannus specimens might represent juvenile individuals of T. rex rather than a separate species. The features, once believed to distinguish Nanotyrannus as a distinct genus, are now considered to be more consistent with growth stages of young T. rex individuals, indicating that they were not a separate species but rather juvenile specimens of the iconic T. rex. The debate surrounding Nanotyrannus is still ongoing though, as some researchers propose further studies and analysis to confirm its taxonomic status and clarify its relationship with Tyrannosaurus rex. Birds are not dinosaurs, banned. The banned, birds are not dinosaurs movement stands as a minority faction within the field of paleontology, disputing the widely accepted evolutionary connection between modern birds and their dinosaurian ancestors. Led by researchers like Dave Peters and Alan Fiducia, this group challenges the prevailing consensus that birds directly evolved from Manoraptorian dinosaurs, a theory supported by extensive fossil evidence and molecular studies. Their stance suggests an alternative lineage for birds, dissociating them from dinosaur ancestry. Instead, proponents of the band movement propose a connection between birds and certain lizard-like terrassic reptiles, such as Longuisquama, as their potential ancestors. They argue that even characteristics found in raptor fossils are convergent adaptions, and not evolutionary links to dinosaurs. Despite the growing body of evidence that consistently highlights bird-like features in dinosaur fossils and genetic studies supporting the avian-dinosaur relationship, the band movement persists in rejecting this widely accepted view. Triassic Kraken The Triassic Kraken hypothesis is a controversial theory proposed by paleontologist Mark Megmanin. This hypothesis suggests the existence of a giant squid or octopus, referred to as the Triassic Kraken during the Triassic period. The theory is based on the peculiar arrangement of the Shawnisaurus remains, a large marine reptile from the Triassic period, found in a deposit in Nevada's Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. McMenamin posits that the Kraken itself arranged these remains in concentric circles, creating a form of self-portrait. The hypothesis is based on circumstantial evidence, as octopuses are mostly soft-bodied and do not fossilize well. The only hard parts, their beaks or mouth parts, have a low chance of being preserved nearby. Despite McMenamin's confidence in his theory, it has not gained widespread acceptance in the scientific community. Critics argue that the evidence can be explained by less exotic means, and without direct or indirect fossil evidence of a kraken, the theory remains speculative. It is often referred to as a paleocryptid, a creature from the past whose existence is not confirmed by the fossil record. Also, let me know if I should cover a paleocryptid iceberg. I think that would be super interesting to delve into. Lamarckism Lamarckism, named after the French biologist Jean Baptiste Lamarck, is an early evolutionary theory that contrasted with Darwin's concept of natural selection. Lamarck proposed that organisms could pass on acquired traits from their lifetime experiences to their offspring. This theory suggested that an organism could modify its traits during its lifetime in response to its environment, and that these acquired traits could be inherited by its progeny. An offside example was the giraffe, where Lamarck suggested that stretching its neck to reach high branches would result in offspring born with longer necks. While Lamarck's original theories have been largely discredited due to the lack of empirical evidence, modern science has uncovered phenomena such as epigenetic inheritance and somatic hypermutation. These discoveries have sparked renewed interest in Lamarckian-like processes in inheritance, 
demonstrating that environmental factors can influence gene expression without altering the underlying DNA sequence. This has led to a resurgence of interest in understanding how non-genetic factors might impact genetic expression. Deccan Traps Kill Dinosaurs The Deccan Traps, an extensive volcanic region formed during the late Cretaceous period in what is now India, might have been a focal point in the discussion of the dinosaur extinction event. This massive volcanic activity occurred around the same period as the end Cretaceous mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. The hypothesis suggests that the release of large quantities of gas during the volcanic eruptions, including sulfur dioxide and other toxic substances, could have contributed to the decline of the dinosaurs, either independently or in combination with the effects of the meteor impact. The intense volcanic activity of the Deccan Traps released substantial volumes of gases and particulates into the atmosphere. This release would have led to the formation of aerosols and acid rain, potentially altering the climate and poisoning the environment. Sulfur dioxide, in particular, could have reacted with water vapor in the atmosphere, leading to the creation of sulfuric acid aerosols, which could have caused long-term changes in global climate patterns. This scenario might have impacted the food chain, vegetation, and marine ecosystems, ultimately contributing to the mass extinction event. Alan Fiducia Alan Fiducia was a prominent paleoorthonologist known for his controversial stance on the relationship between birds and dinosaurs, a view notably adopted by the band. Fiducia fiercely opposed the widely accepted theory of avian evolution from theropod dinosaurs, arguing that birds did not descend from dinosaurs. Instead, he proposed an alternative ancestor for birds, pointing to Drepanosaurus, a Triassic reptile with a lizard-like body and a bird-like beak skull, as the potential origin. According to Fiducia, Drepanosaurus evolved flight through tree gliding, distancing the evolution of birds from dinosaur ancestry. Fiducia also suggested that many iconic bird-like dinosaurs, including Archaeopteryx, were incapable of flight and were in fact, flightless. His views were once influential and impacted the study of the dinosaur-bird connection, having research in favor of his alternative theories. But over time, Fiducia's perspective have been widely discredited and are now considered pseudoscientific. Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis proposes a controversial explanation for the sudden climate shift during the Younger Dryas period and the subsequent extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. This theory suggests that a meteor impact might have been responsible for triggering these significant environmental changes. Proponents of the hypothesis assert that the impact of a meteor or comet could have generated catastrophic consequences, leading to the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling event and potentially contributing to the decline or extinction of various large animal species. One aspect supporting this theory is the proposed identification of a crater in Greenland, purportedly linked to the Younger Dryas impact event. Researchers suggest that evidence found in the Greenland ice cores and geological studies hints at a potential impact event around the same time as the Younger Dryas onset. However, the exact connection between this proposed impact crater and the environmental changes remain a subject of debate. So, despite intriguing evidence, this theory still remains a fringe idea. Esoteric Anthropogenesis Esoteric anthropogenesis is a mystical idea about how humans evolved spiritually, developed by thinkers like Madame Blavatsky and Rudolf Steiner. They suggested that human evolution involves different stages called root races. Each root race represents a particular phase in humanity's spiritual growth and is linked to different times in history. Madame Blavatsky talked about these root races as part of a larger story of human history that mixes myths and ancient beliefs. Rudolf Steiner built on these ideas by creating more detailed stories about human origins. He combined unusual theories from the Victorian era with mystical thoughts to craft a complex view of our past. According to Steiner, human evolution didn't follow the same path as what scientists typically believe. He described a sequence where humans went from being formless entities to giant Aryan beings. Steiner claimed these ancient Aryans communicated through thoughts and lived alongside creatures like plesiosaurs. These ideas are said to be based on spiritual beliefs, mixing myths, old stories, and spiritual concepts to create a different story of how humans came to be. Arboreal Hypsilophodon In 1912, paleontologist Otanio Abel put forth an interesting but eventually outdated theory about the lifestyle of Hypsilophodon, a small herbivorous dinosaur. Abel suggested that Hypsilophodon possessed feet with opposable toes that could grasp onto tree branches. This concept gained acceptance for over three decades, influencing many early depictions that portrayed Hypsilophodon with a vertical posture, a tail used for gripping, and an image resembling a modern tree kangaroo standing on a branch. However, despite the initial acceptance of this arboreal hypothesis, 
Sometimes this began to question its validity due to the absence of other physical traits indicating an arboreal lifestyle in Hypsilophodon. The turning point came in 1971 when P.M. Galton published an extensive review that contradicted the arboreal theory. Galton's research provided evidence suggesting that Hypsilophodon had horizontal posture, a raised tail, and feet more suited to a grounded lifestyle rather than one adapted for climbing trees. Alien greys evolved from dinosaurs The idea that aliens, particularly the greys and reptiles, reported in UFO encounters are descendants of intelligent, spacefaring dinosaurs is a concept found in some ufological and conspiracy theory literature. This idea suggests that these extraterrestrial beings have their origins traced back to intelligent dinosaurs that, according to the theory, somehow managed to leave Earth before the meteor impact event, which is believed to have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. This idea doesn't really have support from mainstream scientific communities though, so it's still considered a conspiracy theory. The concept combines elements of science fiction, conspiracy theories, and imaginative narratives rather than being grounded in credible scientific research or empirical observation. It does make for a really interesting theory though. Shiva Hypothesis The Shiva Hypothesis, also known as Coherent Catastrophism, is a theory that suggests global natural catastrophes on Earth, such as extinction events, occur at regular intervals due to the periodic motion of the Sun in relation to the Milky Way galaxy. This hypothesis was initially proposed in 1971 by William Napier and Victor Kloop, who suggested that gravitational disturbances caused by the solar system crossing the plane of the Milky Way galaxy could disturb comets in the Oort cloud surrounding the solar system. This would send comets towards the inner solar system, increasing the chance of an impact. According to the hypothesis, this results in the Earth experiencing large impact events approximately every 30 million years. The theory was later developed by Michael R. Rampino and Bruce Haggerty, who renamed it after Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction. Sapiens genocide all other human species Throughout much of our evolutionary past, Homo sapiens coexisted with various other human species. Evidence suggests that at least nine distinct species of humans inhabited the planet alongside Homo sapiens. However, by around 10,000 years ago, all these other human species had become extinct. While the exact reasons behind each extinction event are complex and localized, there's growing evidence that Homo sapiens played a role in the demise of these close relatives. William Golding's 1955 novel The Inheritors painted a moving picture of a small Neanderthal group facing complete annihilation, suggesting the theory that Homo sapiens might have deliberately contributed to the extinction of other human species. This novel helped popularize the idea that our species may have been responsible for the disappearance of these human relatives. Additionally, the book hinted at a then fringe theory proposing interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Initially considered pseudoscience, this idea has since been substantiated by genetic research. Modern genetic studies have shown conclusive evidence of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, indicating that these two species definitely had contact and intermixed at various points in history. Goblin Toenails and Snake Tongues Alright, just judging by the name, you can see how the deeper we're going in this iceberg, the entries are definitely getting weirder. I'm excited to get into the final tiers, so expect part 3 very soon. Anyways, in English folklore, during ancient times, certain fossils found by people were identified and given weird explanations. For instance, ammonite fossils, which resemble spiral-shaped cells, were believed to be goblins' toenails in folklore. These ammonite fossils were viewed as mysterious objects, often sparking supernatural tales and stories in local communities. People would come across these peculiar shaped fossils and attribute them to mythical creatures like goblins, creating fantastical tales about their origins. Similarly, fossilized shark teeth were referred to as snake tongues in folklore. These fossilized teeth, with their sharp and peculiar appearance, were thought to resemble the tongues of snakes by people who encountered them. They became part of folklore and were used in stories or folk beliefs. Beyond their role in folklore though, these fossils also found practical use in ancient times. They were utilized in traditional medicine, believed to possess healing or magical properties. Additionally, they were also commonly displayed in curiosity cabinets, collections that showcased various different oddities and artifacts, attracting interest by people due to their unusual shapes and appearances. Aquatic Ape Hypothesis The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis is a speculative idea proposing that at some point in human evolutionary history, our ancestors had a semi-aquatic phase that influenced our physical traits and behaviors. This hypothesis suggests that certain human characteristics, such as hairlessness, bipedalism, under the skin fat distribution, and the ability to hold breath voluntarily may have been adaptions acquired through a period of living in a semi-aquatic or aquatic environment. The hypothesis was initially proposed 
by marine biologist Alistair Hardy in the 1960s and later popularized by writer Elaine Morgan. Proponents of the aquatic ape hypothesis suggest that our ancestors might have inhabited coastal or aquatic environments, potentially foraging for food or taking refuge in aquatic settings. Supporters of this hypothesis argue that traits like a relatively hairless skin, which differs from other primates, could have evolved as adaptions to an aquatic environment, eating and swimming or regulating body temperature. Additionally, characteristics such as our upright posture and the location of our nose are also cited as potential aquatic adaptions. It's an interesting take, but the theory still remains pretty controversial. Sex Lakes The concept of sex lakes in relation to dinosaur extinction is a theory proposed by Brian Ford, suggesting that dinosaurs were at least semi-aquatic creatures and that the rapid depletion of mating lakes was a significant factor leading to their extinction. According to his theory, these bodies of water, termed sex lakes, played a crucial role in mating and reproduction of dinosaurs. Ford proposed that a sudden drying up or depletion of these vital lakes resulted in a catastrophic decline in dinosaur populations, ultimately contributing to their extinction. The term sex lakes has since become a meme though, used jokingly to refer to unconventional or less scientifically supported theories regarding the extinction of dinosaurs. The idea has garnered attention for its unusual premise and has been associated with ill-considered or fringe theories about dinosaur extinction, especially in popular culture and online forums. Dinosaurs killed by inertia. The theory proposing that dinosaur extinction was caused by evolutionary inertia was once a popular idea rooted in old perceptions of dinosaurs as excessively large, slow-witted creatures. This theory suggested that dinosaurs became excessively large and intellectually limited, resulting in their inability to adapt to changing environments, ultimately leading to their demise. The concept was influenced by orthogenetic thinking, a belief that evolution follows a predetermined, confined path towards an inevitable outcome in this case, self-destruction. In the past, this theory was presented in many dinosaur books, painting a picture that dinosaurs had become too unwieldy and inefficient for survival, paving the way for their extinction and allowing mammals to take their place in the ecosystem. However, this theory had several shortcomings. For instance, it overlooked the fact that during the Jurassic period, considered the heyday of dinosaurs, many large and successful species thrived, contrary the notion that large size alone led to their downfall. Functionalism, Cuvier. Georges Cuvier, referred to as the father of paleontology, significantly shaped the early scientific understanding of our prehistoric life. He's credited with pioneering the concept of species extinction and developing the method of comparative anatomy. However, Cuvier fiercely opposed the idea of transmutation of species or evolution, engaging in famous non-evolutionary functionalism debates with scientists like Lamarck. Cuvier's perspective asserted that different species appearing in various geological layers were not the result of evolutionary processes but were separately and fully formed through distinct creation events at different times. He argued that each species remained unchanged until its eventual extinction. According to Cuvier, every species was meticulously designed to serve a specific function, and even minor changes could render it non-functional. His authoritative stance and influential position in the field of paleontology halted serious scientific inquiry into evolutionary theories until after his death. Cuvier's strong opposition to the idea of species transformation basically hindered the acceptance and exploration of evolutionary concepts during his lifetime. Cuvier's non-evolutionary functionalism, though influential in his time, eventually gave way to the advancement of evolutionary theories proposed by scientists such as Charles Darwin that are accepted now. Archaeology Archaeology, sort of seen from the name, is a field focused on searching for evidence related to Noah's Ark, as described in religious texts, particularly the Bible. Archaeologists seek to find physical remains or artifacts believed to be associated with a legendary vessel that, according to a biblical narrative, preserved Noah, his family, and pairs of animals during a catastrophic global flood. Mount Ararat in Turkey has been a focal point for claims about the possible location of Noah's Ark, with some enthusiasts and researchers conducting expeditions or investigations in this region in pursuit of evidence supporting the Ark's existence. During the early development of geology as a scientific discipline, Flood geology significantly influenced interpretations of Earth history. This perspective, rooted in religious beliefs and the biblical narrative of a worldwide flood, shaped many early geological interpretations. Flood geology contributed to the emergence of terms like antediluvian, meaning before the flood, and influenced prominent early geological theories such as Neptunism and Burnett's sacred theory. These theories proposed that geological features were the result of supernatural or catastrophic events aligning with the idea of a global flood described in religious texts. 
Monodology. Monodology is a philosophical concept that regards the fundamental building blocks of existence as individual entities called monads. This theory suggests that these monads are made of divine or absolute substance, which is infinite and omnipresent. The idea attributes a universal substance to God or the absolute, describing it as a substance whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. According to monodology, individual entities, whether organic such as living organisms or inorganic such as objects, are all composed of these monads, each possessing its own unique characteristics. Unlike vitalism, which attributes specific vital forces to living beings, monodology views both living and non-living entities as arising from the same simple substance. This includes thoughts, ideas, perceptions, and species, all conceived as manifestations of these monads. Before Darwin's theory of evolution, the concept of species rising and falling based on the nature of the originating monad held prominence in scientific and philosophical thought. Richard Owen, a prominent biologist and Darwin's contemporary, was a proponent of monodology. Owen opposed Darwin's idea of species adapting or going extinct due to environmental changes. According to Owen, extinction was an inevitable consequence of a species reaching old age, similar to individuals dying when their living energy had reached its natural limit. However, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, published in On the Origin of Species, offered a completely different perspective. Also, let me know if you guys have read that book. I haven't read it yet, but I really want to. Ediacaran Garden The Ediacaran biota, a group of ancient organisms that lived around 635 to 541 million years ago, presents a fascinating mystery in evolutionary history. These organisms, found in fossil records from the Ediacaran period, exhibit diverse and peculiar body plans that differ significantly from any life forms present on Earth today. They display unique features such as fractal growth patterns, asymmetrical spiral shapes, and even internal structures resembling accretions of silt which some researchers speculate may have served as a type of rudimentary skeletal system. Numerous hypotheses have been proposed to explain the nature and identity of the Ediacaran organisms. These range from suggestions associating them with lichens, fungi, algae, sneadarians like jellyfish or sea anemones, or even considering them as abiotic traces mistaken for organic fossils. One intriguing hypothesis proposed by Mark McMenamin introduces the concept of the Ediacaran garden. This hypothesis suggests that the Ediacarans were an entirely unique group of organisms, referred to as pair animals, which emerged as a crucial evolutionary intersection between plants and animals. McManaman proposed that these organisms represented a distinct evolutionary branch, displaying characteristics reminiscent of plants by exhibiting behaviors and lifestyles more similar to animals, sort of like a plant animal. Dinosaur Psychology In the field of dinosaur behavior, often termed paleoethology, their attempts to reconstruct the behavior and interactions of dinosaurs based on available evidence such as fossilized trackways, nesting sites, and bone structures. These clues can provide insights into local mation, social interactions, nesting behaviors, and even potential hunting strategies of certain dinosaur species. However, figuring out non-material aspects like cognition, emotions, or cultural behaviors from fossil evidence remains a significant challenge. While modern animals' behavior can sometimes offer parallels for speculation, Accurately attributing specific psychological states or cultural practices to extinct creatures is highly speculative. Some paleoethologists draw upon evidence from animal behaviors observed in modern birds and reptiles, which are evolutionary descendants of dinosaurs, to make educated guesses about certain behaviors. Pharmacuto paleontology. Pharmacuto paleontology refers to a belief or practice of using fossils in traditional or occult medical treatments. In some cultures, including present-day China, there exists a belief in the healing or mystical properties of certain fossils for medicinal purposes. Fossils like Amonides or shark teeth may have been historically used in traditional Chinese medicine, associated with specific health benefits or remedies. This practice might stem from cultural beliefs or folklore regarding the perceived medicinal properties of these ancient remains. Similarly, in English folklore, there are beliefs in the therapeutic or magical qualities of certain fossils. For instance, like we talked about in an early entry, Ammonides were occasionally referred to as snake tongues, and fossilized shark teeth were identified as goblin toenails. These fossils were sometimes incorporated into medicinal practices or considered items of mystical significance, likely due to their unusual shapes and appearances. Saltationism Saltationism is a theory in evolutionary biology that proposes species evolved through sudden and significant leaps or jumps, referred to as saltations, 
Rather than graduate through the accumulation of small, incremental changes as proposed by Darwinian natural selection, this concept suggests that new species arise rapidly through the occurrence of hopeful monsters or individuals with sudden and substantial mutations that serve as the foundational for new species to emerge. Additionally, presented as an alternative to Darwin's theory of natural selection, saltationism posited the idea that major evolutionary changes were the result of these abrupt and substantial mutations. Despite its initial dismissal, some scholars such as Richard Goldsmith and later Stephen J. Gold reintroduced certain aspects of saltationism into evolutionary theory. They proposed the concept of punctuated equilibria, suggesting that evolutionary changes occur in relatively rapid bursts during periods of stasis, followed by long periods of stability in species. This idea highlighted episodes of rapid speciation or evolutionary change, supporting the notion that significant evolutionary developments can occur relatively quickly in geological timescales. Archaeoraptor The Archaeoraptor fossil became a notable case in paleontology due to its status as a fabricated fossil, representing an attempted hoax to depict the missing link between dinosaurs and birds. This composite fossil was created by combining the body of a bird-like dinosaur, known as Microraptor, with the tail and hind legs of a bird, possibly from the species Yanornis. In 1999, the quote-unquote discovery of Archaeoraptor was published by National Geographic magazine highlighting it as a significant evolutionary find linking dinosaurs and birds. However, suspicions arose regarding the authenticity of the fossil, with some paleontologists raising concerns about possible forgery or manipulation of the specimen. Subsequent investigations revealed that the Archaeoraptor fossil was actually a composite forgery, artificially created by combining unrelated fossil parts to give the appearance of a transitional creature between dinosaurs and birds. It was an attempt to portray a missing link that did not actually exist in the fossil record. The publication of the Archaeoraptor findings, despite warnings of potential forgery, led to comparisons with a Piltdown Man affair, if anyone remembers it from Tier 1, a notorious case in which a fraudulent fossil was presented as an early human ancestor in the early 20th century. Old Away Man The Old Away Man refers to a complete skeleton discovered by German paleontologist Hans Reck at Olduvai George, Tanzania in 1913. Initially, Reck believed the skeleton to be a middle Pleistocene Homo sapiens a claim that if true would have really altered our understanding of human evolution. This was because of the skeleton's location in a geological layer known as Bed II, which Rec dated to more than 150,000 years ago, meaning it would have been the oldest known skeleton of Homo sapiens. However, by 1932, this theory was largely dismissed. The skeleton was reassessed and determined to be a modern Homo sapiens, buried around 20,000 years ago rather than being from the Middle Pleistocene era. This conclusion was supported by the lack of other similar remains in the geological layer. So, while it was an exciting find, it was generally based on misconceptions of its actual timeline. Toba Eruption Caused Genetic Bottleneck The Toba Eruption, a massive supervolcano event that occurred around 74,000 years ago in present-day Indonesia, is often linked to a theory of a genetic bottleneck in human evolution. The theory basically suggests that the eruption caused a severe reduction in the human population, due to its impact on the global climate, potentially leading to a 10-year volcanic winter that destroyed food sources. This event is thought to have reduced the human population to between just 3,000 and 10,000 individuals. However, some researchers argue that the evidence check doesn't really support a significant population decrease coinciding with the Toba eruption. For instance, ancient stone tools found in southern India, both above and below a thick layer of Toba ash, suggest that the local population might have actually survived the eruption. Also, advancements in genomics and climate modeling, as well as new paleoenvironmental samples, have led to alternative explanations for the genetic bottleneck that was observed. One such example is the founder effect, which basically says genetic variation can also be caused from small populations creating their own groups from pre-existing large ones, leading to a genetic bottleneck that might have been observed there. Venusian Dinosaurs The concept of dinosaurs on Venus comes from the early days of astronomy when Venus was shrouded in mystery due to its dense cloud cover. This led to a bunch of wild speculations about its potential habitability. Some imagined Venus as a swampy, dinosaur-filled world, an idea that found its way into various science fiction stories. For instance, Gustavus W. Pope's 1985 novel, Journey to Venus, depicted a lush Venusian landscape inhabited by dinosaur-like beasts. This idea was also popularized in March 1950 issue of the Coronet magazine, which features a story about a family vacationing on Venus, visiting a zoo filled with dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures. However, these speculations were put to rest when the Venera IV and Mariner 5 probes landed on Venus in 1965, 
revealing the planet's true inhospitable nature. While the idea of Venusian dinosaurs is scientifically unfounded, it still remains a pretty cool concept in science fiction. Bruhat Chaosaurus Bruhat Chaosaurus, meaning huge bodied lizard, is a potentially enormous dinosaur discovered in the Kalamedu Formation of India. Initially classified as a theropod, it was later identified as a Titosauronian sauropod, a group of long necked herbivorous dinosaurs. The dinosaur's size is a subject of debate. Some estimates suggest it could have been longer than 35 meters and weighed over 80 tons. Its tibia, or leg bone, is believed to be 30% larger than that of Argentinosaurus, another massive dinosaur. If these estimates are correct, Brahatkaiosaurus might have been one of the largest land animals to ever exist, rivaling the size of the blue whale. However, these estimates are based on fragmentary remains and the original fossils have reportedly disintegrated. Some researchers have even suggested that the bones might actually be pieces of petrified wood. This, combined with a lack of comprehensive documentation of the original discovery, has led to some controversy and mystery surrounding the dinosaur's true existence and size. Vitalism Vitalism is an ancient philosophical concept dating back to at least Aristotle's era, proposing that living organisms possess a distinct essence or vital force that separates them from inanimate matter. Vitalism was widely influential in medieval Europe, serving as a prevailing belief about the nature of life. It was further developed during the emergence of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries, as a contrast to the mechanistic view on life. Vitalism asserts that the functions of a living organism cannot be explained by physical and chemical forces alone, suggesting that life is in some part self-determining. In the 18th and 19th centuries, vitalism became a topic of debate among biologists. Vitalist biologists propose a hypothesis to show inadequacies with mechanistic explanations, but their experiments failed to provide support for vitalism. Today, biologists consider vitalism to have been refuted by empirical evidence, and is often regarded as pseudoscience. Nuclear tectites Tectites are glassy objects shaped like pebbles or droplets, believed to form when meteorites strike the Earth's surface. These impacts generate immense heat and pressure, causing the surrounding rock to melt and eject molten material into the atmosphere. This material cools as it travels through the air, solidifying into tectites before landing back on Earth. The mystery surrounding tectites' origin, combining with their glass-like appearance, led to various theories about their formation. One such intriguing theory arose from the resemblance between tectites and a substance known as desert glass, formed during atomic bomb tests. Some theorists, drawing connections between tectites and the glass created by modern atomic detonations, speculated about the possibility of prehistoric nuclear explosions created by an advanced ancient civilization. This speculative idea suggested that ancient people might have possessed advanced technology and used nuclear weapons in the distant past. However, current geological and scientific studies of tectites consistently support their formation as a result of meteor impacts. However, current geological studies show their formation as a result of meteor impacts, rather than an ancient nuclear explosion, so it's still just a theory out there. Silurian Hypothesis The Silurian Hypothesis is a thought experiment proposed by astrophysicist Adam Frank and Gavin Schmitz in 2018. It explores the possibility of an ancient civilization existing on Earth before humans, and if it did, how we'd be able to tell if it actually existed or not. The hypothesis is named after the Silurians, a fictional series from the BBC series Doctor Who, who had an advanced civilization before humanity. The hypothesis questions Martin Science's ability to detect evidence of such a civilization, which could have existed several million years ago. The most probable cues of finding such a civilization could be carbon, radioactive elements, or temperature variation. However, finding direct evidence such as technological artifacts is unlikely due to the rarity of fossilization and the constant changes of Earth's surface. The Silurian hypothesis also considers the kinds of signals our own civilization would leave if we disappeared and someone looked for a civilization 10 or 20 million years from now. The researchers conducted that our probable impact on the planet will be detectable, but in some ways hard to distinguish from other various events in geological records. Let me know your guys' thoughts on the experiment since it's pretty fascinating to think about. Paleo microbes currently dethawing. Alright, this one's kinda like straight out of a movie. Basically, because of human induced climate change, the melting of polar ice caps poses a potential risk of ancient viruses being released from their frozen state. These viruses, known as paleoviruses, have been trapped in ice for thousands or even millions of years. The concern arises from the possibility that as the ice thaws, these ancient viruses could be released into the environment. This could potentially lead to unforeseen consequences, including the introduction of new viruses into the ecosystem, causing risks to both wildlife and human health. 
The consequences of this microbial waking are still not fully understood though, and scientists are working to learn more about the potential impacts. It does sound really scary though, knowing that viruses are out there that could potentially awake after thousands of years. Humpback Spinosaurus Spinosaurus was initially thought to have a hump on its back, similar to a bison. This theory was based on the discovery of tall, thick spines on top of the dinosaur's vertebrae. The first partial skeleton of Spinosaurus was found in 1912 in Egypt, and the paleontologist Ernest Stromer described it as a spine lizard from Egypt due to these distinctive spines. He theorized that these spines formed a fatty hump, a feature never before seen in a carnivorous dinosaur at the time. However, in 1944, the fossils were destroyed during a bombing raid, leaving much of the original Spinosaurus remains lost. The humpback theory was later challenged, with some scientists proposing that Spinosaurus and other dinosaurs with similar spines were not sail-backed, but humpbacked. This idea suggested that if Spinosaurus had a thick hump, it probably walked on all fours instead of balancing on two legs, like other large theropods. However, this theory still is ongoing and hasn't been really universally accepted. Omega Point The Omega Point is a concept that envisions the universe's future trajectory, where the entirety of the cosmos moves to a final point of unification. This idea was proposed by the French Jesuit Catholic priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He described the Omega Point as a theoretical event marking the culmination of the universe's evolution, where all existence converges to a singular, unified state. Tillard de Chardin's concept of the Omega Point has been associated with the idea of singularity, where the use of science and technology will significantly enhance the human state, leading to a leap out of our biology. In simpler terms though, the Omega Point is like a destination at the end of a journey, where everything in the universe comes together. It's kind of like a grand finale of a fireworks show. Some people have also connected the Omega Point with the idea of beings reaching a level of intelligence where they transcend time and space. This concept has sparked various interpretations and discussions, and it continues to be a thought-provoking idea in fields like philosophy, science, and theology. Dragons are genetic memories of dinosaurs The idea that dragons are genetic memories of dinosaurs just sounds like a really cool theory just from the name. The theory, popularized by pop science writer Carl Sagan in his book Dragons of Eden, suggests that dragon mythology stems from a genetic memory imprinted on the brains of our mammalian ancestors, who lived in fear of dinosaurs. The theory proposes that the ancient legends of dragons, found in diverse cultures around the world, could be based on real-life encounters with dinosaurs by early humans. Some proponents of this idea point to the similarities between the descriptions of dragons in various mythologies and the physical characteristics of certain dinosaur species. They argue that the sheer number of names given to dragons or dinosaurs worldwide builds a strong argument that dragon legends reflect encounters with real creatures. Additionally, carvings, sculptures, paintings, and other forms of art from various cultures depict creatures that sort of resemble specific dinosaurs. 36,000 Year Cycle The 36,000 Year Cycle, as proposed by Plato, represents the early understanding of geological time. Plato's notion of a looping 36,000 year golden age, followed by 36,000 years of destruction and chaos, influenced cosmological theories until the 17th century. This cyclic view of time was prevalent in many cultures before the widespread acceptance of a linear understanding of history like we know now. The transition to a linear view of Earth's history as exemplified by James Usher's dating of the creation to 4004 BC marked a significant shift. However, there were flaws in Usher's dating that became apparent, and so cyclic visions of Earth's history came back as the main thing. Even Charles Lyell, a prominent geologist, talked about the cyclic nature of Earth's history, suggesting that the age of dinosaurs, like a clock, would come again in the future. With techniques now though like radiometric dating to determine the ages of fossils, we're properly able to establish the linear timeline of Earth's history. I wonder what people would have thought back then though when the idea that dinosaurs might have come back was introduced. Captain Beauclerc's Prehistoric Horse Haunting This entry is about the interesting story of Captain Beauclerc's encounter with the alleged ghost of a prehistoric horse. While visiting East Overhaul, Captain Beauclerc apparently stumbled upon fossilized horse bones within a cave on the estate's ground. According to his account, that very night he experienced a terrifying encounter with what he believed to be the haunting spirit of the prehistoric horse. Buclair claimed that the ghostly presence chased him, causing him to faint from fear. When he went to return the bones to the original resting place in the ancient cave, the ghost didn't appear again. When people went to investigate this, various species of giant fossil horses had been discovered in Europe, but the exact type of horse mentioned in Buclair's narrative remains unspecified and unconfirmed, leaving it as a mystery in both folklore and paleontology. Abiogenic Oil 
The abiogenic oil theory suggests that oil is not formed from prehistoric organic matter, but instead originates from deep, underground microbial communities called the deep hot biosphere. This idea doesn't really have any academic support, but instead has been used by the fossil fuel industry as public relations to obscure the causes of climate change. The theory proposes that oil is formed inorganically, deep within the earth, rather than being the result of slow transformation of animal and plant matter into hydrocarbons. Oil companies use the abiogenic oil theory to their advantage by emphasizing their competitive advantage in oil and gas production. This approach is basically intended to maintain the relevance of their fossil fuel businesses. By promoting the idea that oil is not slowly derived from prehistoric organic matter, these companies seek to downplay the urgency of transitioning away from fossil fuels, which we know has advocated a bunch for to prevent climate change from rising. William Denton William Denton was a 19th century geologist who gained notoriety for his unorthodox approach to geological research. He was known for incorporating occult spiritualistic methods, particularly the practice of psychometry, into his work. Psychometry is a technique that claims to extract knowledge telepathically from objects, often by touch. According to Denton, he or a fellow sensitive would hold a fossil object in their hands and supposedly receive visions or insights about its deep history and the Earth's ancient past. Denton claimed to have experienced intense visionary episodes where he allegedly witnessed the rapid unfolding of the Earth's history as well as moments of uncovering precise details about specific rock strata. He even went as far as authoring several textbooks on geology based on these unconventional methods. Lost World in Deep Sea Before the 1960s, there was a widespread belief that life in the deepest parts of the ocean, known as the benthic zone, was extremely sparse. Some scientists even thought that the creatures found there were just temporary migrants from shallower depths. There was also a theory suggesting that due to the harsh conditions in the benthic zone, life forms there evolved at exceptionally slow pace. Early explorations like those conducted by HMS Challenger and naturalist BB's Bytesphere expeditions revealed strange and unique creatures from the deep sea. This led to the idea that the deep ocean might be a sanctuary for prehistoric life that had become extinct elsewhere. Some speculated that organisms from periods like the Carboniferous or Cambrian might actually still exist in these depths. Ernest Haeckel also proposed the existence of a primordial form of life called a menorah on the sea floor suggesting that new species occasionally evolved from this mass. Nowadays, the concept of an abyssal lost world has been debunked though, since as we know, the deep sea hosts a more active and diverse ecosystem than previously thought. Hector's Ichthyosaur The story of Hector's Ichthyosaur tells of a potentially gigantic vertebrate that was lost in a shipwreck off the coast of New Zealand. According to Hector's estimates, this ichthyosaur would have been significantly larger than any known ichthyosaur possibly surpassing even the size of the largest known one, Shastasaurus. If Hector's estimates were correct, this ichthyosaur could have been a contender for the title of the largest animal ever to exist. Unfortunately though, due to the loss in the shipwreck, further study and verification of its size and existence became impossible, so it's basically a mystery out there. Some sources suggest that it might have approached the size of a blue whale, meaning it really would have been a massive creature. To trap tricks. William Beebe, a prominent American naturalist, proposed the concept of a four-wing glider, or Chitraptorix, in 1915. This theory suggested that the earliest bird was a four-winged ancestor depicted as a dino bird who lived in the trees. According to Beebe, this stage represented a transitional phase in which the wing bones increased in size, the hand bone fused, and the fingers became covered in flesh and tendons. This stage was envisioned as an intermediate step between non-avian dinosaurs and modern birds, depicting a creature with four wings. Beebe's hypothesis was largely the mist at the time, however with the recent paradigm shift in bird evolution and the discovery of the four-winged Microraptor, Beebe's Tetraptorix concept has now gained renewed attention and support. The idea of a four-winged stage in bird evolution has now been revisited in light of new evidence. Beringer Stones The Beringer Stones were a collection of limestone pieces that were carved into the shape of various fictitious animals and other unlikely objects. They were discovered in 1975 by Professor Johann Bartholomeus Adam Beringer, who believed them to be fossils. Some of the stones bore the name of God in Hebrew, leading Beringer to suggest that they might be of divine origin. Beringer, a royal physician and dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the Uni of Wuzgur, published a manuscript on the discovery of these remarkable fossils, which depicted all manner of unlikely things, from copulating frogs, spiders in their webs, tiny mermaids, and again the Hebrew script spelling the name for God. He concluded that the fossils were signatures of God, or possibly artifacts carved by antediluvian pagans. 
the revelation that the stones were fake led to a huge scandal, and Beringer's reputation was irreparably damaged. He went as far as even suing the perpetrators, which actually ended up being two of Beringer's colleagues, J. Ignaz Roderick and George von Eckhart. Atlantean Mammoths In a speculative theory explored by Robin Collins in the book Did Spacemen Colonize the Earth? Mammoth fossils discovered in marine deposits are linked to the legendary lost civilization of Atlantis. Collins puts forward an unconventional interpretation suggesting that these mammoth remains could be evidence associated with the fate of Atlantis. According to Collins, these mammoths were potentially domesticated by the inhabitants of the lost underwater city. He also proposed some wild theories that these mammoths were actually the result of genetic experimentations conducted by malicious aliens under sophisticated outer space laboratories. Collins also extends his theory to propose a connection between the extinction of dinosaurs and the activities of these ancient aliens. He suggests that they were responsible for the dinosaurs' extinction by using powerful atomic weapons carelessly, ending up in the eradication of dinosaurs. This fringe theory essentially offers a controversial narrative, combining elements of prehistoric creatures, mythical civilizations, and alleged extraterrestrial intervention. Bond Stegosaurus Proposed by an early paleontologist, Bond's portrayal differs significantly from the widely accepted understanding of Stegosaurus. Unlike the traditional image of a four-legged dinosaur with distinct plates on its back and a thagomizer at the tip of its tail, Bond's Stegosaurus depicted the creature in a notably different light. This depiction presented Stegosaurus as a semi-bipedal animal, suggesting a posture more similar to that of a pangolin, an animal known for its armored exterior. In Bond's representation, the thagomizer horns, usually found only at the tail's end, were extended along the entire length of the body, creating an unusual and striking appearance. This depiction introduced a novel perspective, but it greatly contrasted with the subsequent and more scientifically grounded reconstructions of Stegosaurus. Bond Stegosaurus is a noteworthy example of how early interpretations in paleontology sometimes diverged from later, more accurate representations as the field developed and new discoveries were made. Eozoan Canadense the Eozoan canadens, initially described by John William Dawson in 1865, was a peculiar finding thought to be a massive shelled protozoan, considered by many as the earliest known life form ever on Earth. The fossils were believed to have been unearthed from limestone blocks and were deemed a vital discovery in understanding the planet's ancient life forms, and it was a pretty big deal entering the name the Dawn Animal. However, the interpretation surrounding Eozoan canadens underwent a great shift in 1894. Further investigation revealed that these structures were not actually traces of ancient life, but were instead formed by recent geological processes. It was determined that these features were not remnants of an ancient organisms, but rather patterns created by the interaction of magma with limestone, a mineral formation known as pseudofossils, like we touched upon before. Spinal Catastrophism Spinal catastrophism is a concept that correlates the evolutionary history of organisms with the structure of the spinal column. This theory suggests that various segments of the spinal column represent different epochs in evolutionary development, mirroring evolutionary events such as mass extinctions. Advocates of this theory propose that different vertebrae along the spine correspond to specific periods in evolutionary history, symbolizing significant milestones or transitions in the species' lineage. Moreover, proponents of the spinal catastrophism, including scholars like Bulk and Owen, extend this concept to the skull, considering it as an extension of the spinal column. They interpreted certain highly modified vertebrae as contrary to the formation and structure of the skull. This theory implies that the entire skeletal structure, particularly the spinal column and the skull, encapsulates the evolutionary journey of an organism. Thomas Moynihan's book, titled Spinal Catastrophism, delves into the historical trajectory and development of this theory, tracing its origins, evolution, and the various perspectives behind it. I'll link it down below if anyone is interested in learning more about the theory. Big Paleo Big Paleo is a phrase used by certain groups, notably creationists and individuals who doubt the existence of dinosaurs, to criticize what they perceive as the intentional concealment or suppressions of evidence related to creationism, the presence of giants, or the existence of living dinosaurs. According to proponents of this belief, a select group of influential paleontologists referred to as Big Paleo actively suppresses or overlooks evidence that contradicts established scientific theories, particularly within the field of paleontology. The alleged motive behind the suppression is to maintain the dominance of mainstream scientific narratives and prevent the wider spreading of information that challenges these established scientific views. It's kind of similar to the concept of Smithsonian suppression that we mentioned in Tier 1, 
which again alleges that the Smithsonian Institution engages in similar activities of intentionally concealing archaeological discoveries. Tetra Protomo, Human Origins in South America Tetra Protomo was a term coined by Alice Herdlka, who claimed to have discovered six distinct prehistoric human species in Argentina. Each of these proposed species was named according to their numerical position in a sequence supposedly leading to Amaran humans. Tetraprotomo was attributed as the fourth in the sequence. Herdlicka's assertions outlined in his book attempted to argue for the origins of humans in South America based on these fossils. However, subsequent research and analysis by other scientists contradicted Herdlicka's claims. Later investigations revealed that the fossils identified as Tetraprotomo and the other species were actually remains of modern Homo sapiens. There is no credible evidence to support the existence of a new or distinct species. The initial conclusions drawn by Herdlicka were found to be inaccurate, linked to the rejection of his proposed species sequence. Owen's Archetype Theory In Richard Owen's 1849 lecture titled On the Nature of Limbs, he proposed the concept of animal archetypes to explain the similarities observed in the limb structures of various vertebrates. According to Owen, these shared characteristics such as the comparable bone structures found in the flippers of dolphins, the wings of bats, and the hands of humans were not evidence of a common evolutionary ancestor. Instead, he suggested that they represented different manifestations of a transcendental or idealized form he termed the vertebrate archetype. Basically, for Owen, the presence of similar skeletal elements in different creatures was not indicative of evolutionary relationships. Rather, he conceptualized these shared features as different expressions of a fundamental blueprint or original archetype. This archetype, according to Owen, was a metaphysical or divine design that served as a blueprint for the structure or vertebrate's limbs, emphasizing form over function and the explanation of anatomical similarities among different species. Planet X Killed Dinosaurs The Nibiru hypothesis is a speculative idea suggesting that a purported hidden planet named Nibiru, sometimes referred to as Planet X, periodically passes through Earth's orbit within a solar system. According to his theory, as Nibiru approaches, its gravitational effects cause significant disturbances, leading to cataclysmic events such as mass extinctions, including the extinction of dead dinosaurs. This concept draws parallels with other hypotheses like the Shiva hypothesis and Nemesis, linking celestial events with major extinction events on Earth. However, like the other celestial event theories we touched upon before, this theory remains part of pseudoscientific ideas about Earth's history and cosmic events. Earth's Italian Petrifying Fluid the Aristotelian theory of petrification fluid was an ancient idea attributed to the Greek philosopher Aristotle, dating back to early observations on the nature and explanation of fossils. In Aristotle's worldview, fossils were mysterious remnants found within rocks and minerals, believed to have been formed through a unique process. He proposed the existence of a mysterious petrifying fluid that had the apparent capability to gradually transform the organic matter of deceased organisms into stone over long periods. This fluid, according to Aristotle's speculation, was responsible for the petrification or lithification of once living creatures, eventually giving rise to the preserved structures that we now know as fossils. Despite its antiquity and eventual impact on early paleontological thinking, this hypothesis, steeped in metaphysical ideas, ultimately proved to be an oversimplified explanation for the complex processes involved in the fossilization of organisms. Nowadays, we know of different processes like mineralization, sedimentation, and tectonic activities occurring over extensive periods to create fossils. Franzvillian biota The Franzvillian biota, also known as Gambaniata, are among the oldest multicellular life forms discovered by French geologist Abdurrazak El Abani in Gabon. They date back approximately 2.1 billion years, marking a significant milestone in the history of life on Earth. These organisms have a peculiar shape resembling two rounded disks with features such as tube structures and petal like extensions despite their underwater habitat. Understanding these ancient life forms has proven challenging though, leading to various interpretations. Some scientists suggest that they might resemble seafloor mats akin to algae, while others compare them to slime mold or early ancestors of later Ediacaran creatures with similar appearances. The most intriguing aspect of these creatures lies in their time period isolation. After their apparent extinction, there's an insane gap of 1.5 billion years until the appearance of the next known examples of multicellular life during the Ediacaran period. This separation implies that the Gambaniata might have been unique experiments in early multicellular life that vanished long before the emergence of modern life forms. Marine Regression Killed Dinosaurs This theory suggests that during the late Cretaceous period, there was a significant drop in global sea levels, causing the exposure of vast portions of the continental shelf. 
This event led to widespread marine extinctions due to the sudden reduction in underwater habitats. Additionally, this sea level regression likely resulted in sudden climate changes, causing extreme weather conditions such as increased aridity and higher temperatures on land. So proponents of this theory even argue that these environmental shifts caused by the sea level regression were responsible for the extinction of dinosaurs. The theory is still ongoing though in scientific research, so it falls as more of a fringe theory in this iceberg chart. Archaeopteryx faked Hoyle Fred Hoyle, a noted astrophysicist, presented a controversial argument assessing that the iconic Archaeopteryx fossils were faked. In his book, Hoyle pointed out what he interpreted as cracks, indicating that a bird skeleton had been attached to a dinosaur skeleton, suggesting potential forgery similar to the Pilton Man hoax. This accusation challenged the authenticity of one of the most significant transitional fossils in paleontology, commonly regarded as a critical piece of evidence for the evolutionary link between dinosaurs and birds. Also, Hoyle, in his later works, ventured into more radical ideas, proposing an alternative to evolution. He theorized that organisms underwent rapid mutations caused by viruses that were born in space, instead of gradual evolutionary processes. In this unconventional concept, he suggested that these viruses had facilitated the transformation of dinosaurs into mammals at the end of the Cretaceous period. However, these ideas went against widely accepted scientific understanding and lacked evidence, positioning Hoyle's theories as outliers in the field of evolutionary biology. Leon Margulis' Controversial Theories Leon Margulis, a prominent microbiologist, introduced a bunch of scientific theories that were met with skepticism and controversy during her career. Her notable theory, Symbiogenesis, or Endosymbiotic Theory, initially considered fringe science, proposed that complex life forms evolved from the symbiotic merging of free living cells into collaborate communities. Margulis proposed that cell organelles like mitochondria and chloroplast were once independent organisms that gradually integrated into cells through symbiosis. Additionally, Margulis was an early proponent of the Gaia hypothesis, which suggests that the Earth functions as a self regulating system. This theory has evolved into mainstream Earth systems theory contributing to our understanding of the interconnectedness and regulation of Earth systems. However, Margulis faced considerable resistance and criticism for her other unconventional ideas throughout her career, leading her to be seen as a scientific rebel. Later in her career, her views became more controversial. For instance, during the AIDS epidemic, she controversially proposed that the disease was not caused by a virus, but was a misidentified strain of syphilis, a position that contradicted the prevailing scientific consensus. Additionally, she was involved in publishing a controversial journal article saying that larval and adult stages in insects had evolved from entirely different organisms. These viewpoints were largely criticized and also considered outliers in the scientific community. Cosmozoa Richter In 1985, a scientist named Richter introduced an interesting idea known as Cosmoza. This theory proposed that microscopic spores, or protoplasm, existed within cosmic dust floating through the vastness of the universe. According to Richter, these tiny entities named Cosmozoa were believed to have seeded Earth during different periods in history. It's kind of like the idea of panspermia, which we talked about before, which suggests that life exists throughout the cosmos and can be distributed between celestial bodies, such as planets via comets, meteorites, or other space debris. Similarly, Cosmozoa proposed that these microscopic life forms traveled through space within cosmic dust and eventually found their way to Earth, potentially contributing to the origin or evolution of life on our planet. This concept was ahead of its time and foreshadowed later ideas in science, such as Fred Hoyle's space virus theory, which also proposed that life's origins might have cosmic connections. While Richard's theory of Cosmozoa was definitely interesting, scientific understanding and evidence regarding the origin of life have evolved a bunch since then. Sauropod trunks The concept of sauropods, the super long-necked dinosaurs like Brachiosaurus, having a proboscis or trunk similar to modern elephants or tapirs is an idea proposed by some paleontologists. This hypothesis stems from observations of certain features in the cranial or head anatomy of some sauropods. Evidence suggesting the possibility of a trunk-like structure in sauropods comes from the nostrils located on the top of their skulls. These nostrils are placed higher up on their head compared to most other dinosaurs, similar to the positioning of nostrils in elephants and tapirs, which have trunks. Additionally, some sauropods possess elongated, downward curving teeth that might have been used for grasping or plucking vegetation, hinting at a potential function similar to what a trunk would serve. The absence of direct fossil evidence for such a soft tissue structure makes this idea speculative though. Soft tissues like trunks rarely fossilize, leaving scientists to rely on clues from bones and other cranial features to basically make educated guesses. 
Martian Paleontology. In 1984, scientists discovered a meteorite on Earth known as ALH-84001, believed to have originated from Mars. This particular meteorite was formed during a time when Mars likely had liquid water on its surface. Upon examining this meteorite, researchers identified tiny, worm-like structures called nanobees. In 1996, a NASA research team suggested that these nanobees might be evidence of ancient extraterrestrial life on Mars. This assertion sparked a bunch of excitement and debate within the scientific community and the public about the possibility of life beyond Earth. The mainstream consensus among scientists though leads towards the belief that these nanobees are more likely to be inorganic or non-biological in nature. The skepticism arises because similar microscopic structures resembling nanobees have been found in other Martian rocks located outside the habitability zone, periods when Mars had no liquid water even present. Additionally, various natural geological processes can create features that resemble biological structures. These can include mineral formations, chemical reactions, or other non-biological mechanisms that might mimic the appearance of ancient microbial life. Underground Ocean Keplerian Tidal Theory The concept of an underground ocean, often linked to the Keplerian Tidal Theory, is mostly like a planetary science theory but also has some paleo aspects to it. In an 1858 article named The Tides, it said that Johannes Kepler, a German astronomer who you all might know from his laws on planetary motion, once speculated that the tides on Earth were influenced by its respirations, as if the planet were a living animal. He even went as far as to say that humans were like insects feeding on the Earth's back. One of the adding on theories he entertained was that the tides were caused by the ocean's water circulating in and out through a large hole at each pole, which communicated from a subterranean passage to the Earth. This theory suggested the existence of an underground ocean. Kepler proposed that the existence of this underground ocean could account for the finding of fossil shells in places far from any sea, such as the summits of mountains, which is explained in Martin Rudwick's book, The Meaning of Fossils. He proposed a theory that shellfish from one area of the ocean may have been carried by the subsurface tidal systems, elevated into streams that flowed through the mountains, and then deposited on the mountainside. In the end though, Kepler rejected the subsurface ocean explanation of Earth's tides, and instead correctly suggested that the moon's gravitational influence was the source of the tides. Waukesha's Butterfly Creature The Waukesha Butterfly Creature is a pretty mysterious organism from the Cambrian period, a time known for its rapid diversification of life and often referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. This creature, which isn't even properly named yet, is an arthropod that lived in an aquatic environment millions of years before the first true butterfly. Even though it's not considered a butterfly since those came after 240 million years, its unique appearance greatly resembles a butterfly. This is because of its bivalve-like shell and a pair of wings extending from its body. Despite the high frequency of fossil remains found in the Waukesha Laguerre State Fossil Site in Wisconsin, the creature's classification is still a mystery, making it one of the most incomprehensible of the Cambrian fauna. Some scientists have suggested it might be related to crustaceans, but that's still a topic of debate out there. Sacred Theory of Earth Burnet Thomas Burnett was an English clergyman and geological theorist who is best known for his work Sacred Theory of the Earth, first published in Latin in 1681 and later translated into English. In the speculative cosmogony, Burnett proposed a hollow earth with most of its water inside until Noah's flood, at which point mountains and oceans appeared. He suggested that earth was originally a perfect sphere and that a series of divine catastrophes including flooding and earthquakes led to its current uneven and mountainous state that we see now. Bernice's theory was an attempt to reconcile the mechanical explanation of the Earth's formation, as proposed by René Descartes, with the biblical account of creation in Genesis. Descartes has suggested that the Earth was once a star that crusted over, and Bernard expanded on this idea by explaining how natural processes could align with the scripture, such as the timing of the Earth cracking open to release the waters for Noah's flood. Bernard's work was controversial though, because he used natural causes to explain biblical events, traditionally conceived as miracles which attracted a lot of negative attention at the time. Despite this, his theory was influential and became a standard against which many geological theories were measured for over a century, as writers felt compelled to adjust their scientific explanations with the biblical creation story. Bernard's theory, while not scientifically accurate by modern standards, still remains an important step in the history of geological thought though, and the attempt to understand the Earth's past. Ancient Armored Whales the idea of armored whales, specifically the prehistoric parody whales known as Zuglodon or Basilosaurus, was based on an interpretation of basilosaurid vertebrae by Dames and Abel. They proposed that these ancient whales were covered in armor plates similar to the giant oceanic armadillo. This theory was further supported by embryological discoveries by Richard Leidecker, a well-known British paleontologist. The supposed armor plates were found in association with Zuglodon remains, 
linked to the belief that these whales had a dorsal bony dermal armor. This re-sparked debates about why ancient whales had been covered in armor and was incorporated into many discussions about Basilosaurus. However, these armor fossils were later debunked by Frederick A. Lucas in 1902, who identified them as misidentified leatherback turtle remains. Despite this, references to the armored stage in whale evolution still persisted up to the 1950s. Also, Bernard Hevlumens, often referred to as the father of cryptozoology, suggested that a relic armor-plated zooglodon could have been the identity of many fin sea serpent sightings. Even though this theory was later disproved, the idea of these whales having armor was still pretty significant in the early description and understanding, giving way to the things we know now. M. Fragilimus Rumors The story of Amphocolias Fragilimus is a pretty controversial chapter in paleontology. Edward Drinker Cope, a prominent paleontologist, described this dinosaur species based on the discovery of a single enormous vertebra that stood over a meter tall. According to Cope's description, this vertebra suggested the existence of an exceptionally large sauropod, potentially the biggest one ever known. However, the fossil of Amphocolias Fragilimus, described as extremely fragile, has since been lost or misplaced. This loss of the fossil has caused some skepticism and debate about the existence and size of the dinosaur. Many researchers question whether the species even exists or not, or if Cope may have exaggerated its size based on limited evidence. The controversy surrounding Amphicolias fragilimus mostly comes from the lack of fossil evidence, though beyond Cope's initial description and a single drawing. The drawing has been scrutinized extensively by paleontologists, with various interpretations and analysis arguing both for and against the dinosaur's massive size. Kenneth Carpenter, among others, has advocated for the accuracy of Cope's original dimensions, supporting the idea that the sauropod could have been one of the largest ever known based on Cope's descriptions. Penin Ghost Pterodactyl The legend of the Penin's Ghost Pterodactyl came from reported sightings of a large, pterosaurus-like creature in the Penin's Hills region of West Yorkshire in 1982. Witnesses claim to have seen a mysterious, ghostly presence resembling a giant pterodactyl flying in the area. According to the accounts, the creature was described as wispy and translucent, giving an ethereal or ghost-like appearance. One of the witnesses, Mike Priestley, managed to capture a photograph of the alleged creature. However, as is pretty common with sightings of cryptids or unusual phenomena, the photograph turned out blurry and inconclusive. When this got to the public, some people were fascinated by the idea of a prehistoric creature seemingly appearing as a ghost in the modern world. To be honest, I personally would be terrified of the thought. I remember seeing size comparisons of pterodactyls with humans, and it's pretty terrifying to say the least. However, the lack of concrete evidence, along with the blurry photograph and the nature of the reports, led most scientists and experts to regard the settings as unsubstantiated and likely a result of misidentification, hoaxes, or optical illusions. Like other cryptid tales out there, it's still pretty much a mystery. Bad eyesight kill dinosaurs, Croft. The hypothesis proposed by ophthalmologist L. R. Croft in 1982 regarding the end Cretaceous extinction event links it to poor eyesight in dinosaurs. Croft suggested that global warming led to widespread cataracts in dinosaurs, ultimately resulting in their extinction. He theorized that many dinosaurs, including species like Ceratopsians, attempted to protect their eyes from the intense sunlight by developing horns and crests. However, these adaptions were ineffective in shielding their eyes from the damaging effects of the sun, leading to vision impairment. Croft imagined a scenario where dinosaurs gradually became blind as they matured, with the majority losing their vision before reaching sexual maturity. This idea though is highly speculative and hasn't really gained traction within the scientific community. There's pretty limited evidence supporting the idea that dinosaurs suffered from widespread cataracts due to global warming. Additionally, the notion that most dinosaurs were rendered blind before even reaching maturity also lacks empirical data or fossil evidence. Dimetrodon as human ancestor Dimetrodon, the famous sailback creature from the Permian period, is commonly misunderstood as a direct ancestor of dinosaurs, or even humans, in popular culture. The reality is though, Dimetrodon is classified as a snapsid, belonging to a group of animals known as mammal-like reptiles. These creatures aren't dinosaurs, but rather are part of a separate lineage called synapsids. Snapsids are pretty important since they eventually gave rise to therapsids, a subgroup within which modern mammals evolved. Although Dimetrodon is a distinct relative within the synapsid lineage, and shares an ancestor with mammals, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a direct ancestor of modern humans or even dinosaurs. Dimetrodon lived long before dinosaurs and humans appeared on Earth. It represents a branch in the evolutionary tree that eventually led to mammals, including humans, but it's more like a distinct cousin rather than direct ancestor. A lot of the traction of this theory basically comes from some popular science outlets or media representations. Glacial Cosmogony This entry is about the concept of an ice wall surrounding the Earth and is often associated with various theories and fringe beliefs, 
including some interpretations in the flat earth community and the concept of an ice ball earth. Flat earth supporters propose a model where they believe the earth is not a sphere but a flat disc shaped plane and they argue that an ice wall or a massive wall of ice encircles the entire disc preventing people from falling off the edge of the earth. On the flip side though the ice ball earth hypothesis in scientific terms proposes extreme ice ages in earth's history suggesting periods where the planet was almost entirely or largely covered in ice like in the ice age movies. This idea is based on geological and paleoclimatological evidence whereas the other is still more of a theory and a fringe belief. Abyss of Time Hutton James Hutton, an influential Scottish geologist from the 18th century, made significant contributions to our understanding of Earth's history and the concept of deep geological time. His observations, particularly at Sicker Point Cliffs in Scotland, led to a great shift in our scientific understanding. At Sicker Point, Hutton noticed rock formations arranged in layers at steep angles. He recognized that these rock layers had been deposited horizontally, then subsequently tilted and eroded, indicating long periods of time and gradual slow geological processes. Hutton realized that the time required for these geological processes to occur must have been far greater than the few thousand years suggested by the biblical accounts of Earth history, which were commonly accepted at the time. Hutton's insights challenged the prevailing idea of a young Earth, with a relatively short history and a series of catastrophic events shaping its geological features. Instead, he proposed the principle of uniformitarianism. This principle suggests that Earth's geological processes occur slowly and consistently over vast spans of time. Hun's concept of deep time, often described as a dizzying abyss of time, introduced the idea of an Earth with a super long history, potentially millions or even billions of years old. Also, Hun's ideas challenged the notion that Earth's history had to include constant human presence or creations linked to humans. He proposed the view of an Earth that existed independent of humans operating under its own natural laws and processes for vast spans of time before human existence. These concepts really changed our scientific perspective on Earth's ancient history like we know now. Heterogenesis Colliker Colliker's concept of heterogenesis was a theory proposed within the framework of saltationism, a departure from Charles Darwin's progressive view of evolution through natural selection. Heterogenesis suggested a mechanism of evolution where new species emerged rapidly from the birth of noticeably distinct individuals, termed heterogenic. Unlike Darwin's theory of evolution, which talks about gradual changes over time due to external environmental pressures and natural selection, heterogenesis proposed that the process of species transformation occurs internally within organisms. Basically, in this theory, the emergence of a new species was believed to be triggered by the sudden appearance or birth of an individual that was completely different from its parent species. This new individual was considered to be the fundamental departure or leap from its ancestor, leading to the rapid emergence of a new species. The concept of heterogenesis is pretty similar to saltationism, which suggests that evolution occurs through abrupt, significant changes or saltations, rather than gradual modifications. Both these theories propose mechanisms that involve sudden and substantial shifts in traits, leading to the formation of new species in a relatively short period. Venomous Dinosaurs In 2009, Empu Gong proposed a hypothesis suggesting that Sinanothosaurus, a small theropod dinosaur, might have possessed grooved elongated fangs suggesting a venomous bite. This hypothesis speculated that Sinornithosaurus could have potentially used venom to immobilize or stun its prey. The basis for this hypothesis primarily stemmed from the examination of the skull and teeth of Sinornithosaurus, particularly the presence of long, grooved fangs resembling those found in some venomous snakes. However, later analysis and further studies, including those conducted by Empu Gong himself, raised doubts about the initial idea of venomous dinosaurs, specifically Sinornithosaurus. Additional research and re-evaluation of the anatomical features observed in these dinosaurs provide alternative explanations for the structures interpreted as venomous adaptions. The grooved elongated fangs, initially thought to be for delivering venom, might have had other purposes. Some researchers now propose that these teeth could have been used for grasping and holding onto prey rather than delivering venom. Others suggest that the grooves in the teeth might have served a different function, such as channeling blood or sensory adaptions rather than venom delivery. It's a pretty cool concept thinking that dinosaurs, who were already so powerful, were equipped with venom, but it's still just a hypothesis. Evolutionary Polygenism The polygenist theory, prevalent before and after Charles Darwin's time, proposed multiple origins for different human races, often arguing that different races emerged from separate ancestors or creation events. The theory contradicted Darwin's monogenesis idea, which posited a single common ancestor for all humans. Proponents of polygenism, including Georges Carbier, 
and Louis Agassiz used their own interpretations of science to argue that various human races were fundamentally different and had separate origins. They sometimes even questioned the humanity of non-white races, reflecting prevailing racist beliefs of their era. Following Darwin's publication of evolutionary theory, some individuals basically misused or misinterpreted Darwin's ideas to basically reinforce their pre-existing racist beliefs. Scientists like Henry Fairford Osborne, Ernest Haeckel, and Carlton Kuhn attempted to support the polygenist view by suggesting that human races were too distinct to have descended from a common ancestor. They proposed that different human groups evolved from different primate ancestors, a perspective inconsistent with growing evidence supporting a shared human ancestry. These viewpoints were flawed and ran counter to accumulating evidence in fields such as anthropology, genetics, and paleontology, which consistently supported the unity of humanity. Attempts to reconcile this flawed theory led some researchers into some pretty dubious paths. One such example was Carlton Kuhn's private belief in the existence of Bigfoot to explain the origins of native North Americans, which lacked scientific basis. Shaver's Rock Boots Richard Sharp Shaver was an author known for his unconventional and highly imaginative stories published in Amazing Stories magazine during the mid 20th century. He gained notoriety for the Shaver Mystery, a series of stories that suggested to be true accounts of an underground world inhabited by abandoned Lemurian ruins, devolved Atlanteans, and evil robots that abducted and tortured humans from the surface. According to Shaver, he received telepathic communication from an underground Lemurian which revealed the existence of this hidden realm and its inhabitants. These stories ended up interesting a bunch of readers with their fantastical elements and mysterious narratives. Later in his career, Shaver delved into what he termed rock boots, in which he interpreted various natural mineral formations, which are geofacts, as containing images and texts related to his Atlantean beliefs. He claimed to discern faces and symbols within rocks and stones, which he interpreted as evidence of this ancient Atlantean civilization. Despite the unconventional nature of his work, Shaver's rock images have gained some attention in the realm of outsider art or folk art due to their intriguing and sometimes haunting visual qualities. Eggshell Pathology Killed Dinosaurs The idea proposed by H.K. Urban in 1979 suggesting that dinosaur extinction was caused by eggshell pathology at the KT, which is the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, is an intriguing but controversial theory in the study of dinosaur extinction. Urban identified a sequence of dinosaurs from the KT boundary that exhibited various pathologies. Some eggs displayed near solidified characteristics, while others had abnormally thin shells. Based on these observations, Urban hypothesized that these eggshell pathologies were indicative of a widespread environmental changes that led to the extinction of dinosaurs. The theory proposed by Urban suggested that changes in the environment possibly related to factors like climate change, changes in vegetation, or alterations in atmospheric conditions could have negatively affected the quality of the eggshells. These weakened or abnormal eggshells might have led to reduced hatchability rates and increased vulnerability of dinosaur embryos, ultimately contributing to their extinction. However, the hypothesis is not widely accepted within the scientific community as the primary cause of dinosaur extinction. Jefferson's Mammoth Thomas Jefferson had a deep interest in natural history, including a fascination with mammoths. In 1787, he wrote a detailed report disputing the theories of French naturalist Buffon, who suggested that American species were inferior to those in Europe. Jefferson used the discovery of mammoth fossils in America to counter Buffon's claims, highlighting the size and significance of the American mammoth as evidence of the continent's unique and impressive natural history. Jefferson's fascination with mammoths extended to his beliefs about their current existence. He was skeptical about the concept of extinction and entertained the idea that mammoths might actually still roam the unexplored regions of the Americas. Some accounts suggest that Jefferson considered the thought of mammoths as carnivorous creatures capable of bounding across the land in great leaps, influenced by the fringe interpretation of the evangelical George Turner. This belief, suggesting a surviving population of mammoths, was not uncommon during Jefferson's time, as there was limited scientific understanding of extinction. Many naturalists and thinkers of that era speculated about the possibility of living remnants of ancient species existing in remote, unexplored regions. Frozen Dinosaur Claims Rumors and tales of frozen dinosaurs preserved in ice, similar to the famous discoveries of frozen mammoth carcasses in Siberia, have been part of cryptozoological lore and speculative stories within pop culture. These accounts often center on the idea of discovering intact dinosaur remains in icy environments. One notable case in cryptozoological literature is the story of the Glacier Island Carcass, reportedly describing the discovery of a giant lizard-like reptile that thawed in Alaska in 1930. The story circulated in speculative narratives, suggesting that the creature was a relic of the dinosaur age preserved in ice. 
While the discovery of well-preserved mammoth remains in frozen environments like Serbia has indeed occurred and contributed to our understanding of prehistoric life, the likelihood of finding intact dinosaur remains preserved in ice is pretty low. This is primarily because dinosaurs lived during the Mesozoic era, tens of millions of years ago, and the remains are typically found as fossilized bones or traces rather than as frozen specimens. The geological time gap between dinosaurs and the more recent frozen environments where mammoth carcasses have been discovered makes the existence of frozen, intact dinosaur specimens highly improbable. But who knows, maybe in the future, a discovery might change it all. Haley's Inner Earths Edmund Haley, a prominent 17th century scholar, proposed a unique theory about the Earth's structure, suggesting that it was not only hollow but also filled with a bunch of smaller, concentric spheres similar to a Russian doll. He based his theory on his observations of periodic magnetic pole shifts. According to Haley, these inner hollow globes rotate independently of each other producing what he termed as the deep music of the rolling world, a seismic music that he claimed to have detected and transcribed in his manuscript on the subject. Despite the initial interest in this theory, later scientific discoveries and advancements led to the discrediting of Haley's proposal. The concept of a hollow earth, including Haley's ideas, has since become a common element in fiction and folklore. Haley's theories, while ultimately disproven, remains an intriguing part of the history of scientific thought and the ongoing human quest to understand the mysteries of the natural world. Astropaleontology Astropaleontology is the hypothetical study of fossils of extraterrestrial organisms, a term first coined by John Amitage. This field is part of the broader discipline of astrobiology, which focuses on the study of the origins, early evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. The primary goal of astropaleobiology, a related field, is to locate and interpret evidence of former life, requiring a multidisciplinary approach that includes scientific efforts from various fields. While the concept of astropaleontology sounds pretty interesting, as of now there's no confirmed evidence of extraterrestrial life, and the study of fossils of extraterrestrial organisms remains speculative. Despite this, the field has attracted attention and has since been the subject of discussions and research, particularly in the context of astrobiological applications. Ray Stanford's Occult Links Ray Stanford was an American amateur paleontologist, known for his significant contributions to paleontology and his remarkable fossil discoveries. He gained attention for his impressive abilities in finding fossils and gathering a vast private collection. However, his views and practices often made him a controversial figure within the scientific community. Stanford was known for being critical of what he perceived as scientific gatekeeping and was sometimes hesitant to share detailed information about his discoveries with the wider scientific community. This reluctance to disclose his findings led to some skepticism and controversy surrounding his work within the field of paleontology. Additionally, Stanford held unconventional beliefs in the field of UFOlogy, the study of unidentified flying objects, and claimed to have had encounters with extraterrestrial beings. He asserted that these encounters had granted him psychic abilities, including the purported ability to find fossils. Stanford attributed his success in finding fossils to these alleged telepathic communications with extraterrestrial entities, rather than simply relying on traditional paleontological methods. Permanent Darkness in Dinosaur Times Thomas Hawkins was an English fossil collector and dealer, particularly known for his work with ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. He published several texts between the 1830s and 1850s, with his two best known works being Memoirs of Ichthyosauri and Plesiosauri, and The Book of the Great Sea Dragons. Hawkins's writings were characterized by a hypermiltonic style, which was very prosaic and dramatic. One of the more unusual and persistent claims across Hawkins's work was the idea that ichthyosaurs and pterodactyls lived in complete darkness. He speculated that the sun's light, if it existed at the time, could not penetrate the atmospheric layers of smog, which maintained a permanently nocturnal surface on Earth. If anyone wants to read more about Hawkins' work, Ralph O'Connor's book, The Earth on Show, Fossils and the Poetics of Popular Science, 1802-1856, is a good one out there that delves into it. This book explores the portrayal of the geological past to the public and examines how new ideas about deep time and Earth's history were communicated during the early Victorian era. Spiral arm causes cyclic mass extinctions. This entry is about the idea that the sun's galactic spiral arm led to cyclic mass extinction events on Earth. This hypothesis suggests a connection between the Earth's position within the Milky Way galaxy spiral arms and major extinction events, such as the Permian Triassic extinction, which occurred around 252 million years ago. Proponents of this theory suggest that as the solar system moves through the Milky Way spiral arms, it encounters varying levels of cosmic radiation, different gravitational forces or altered distributions of interstellar matter. These encounters, as theorized, could potentially trigger disturbances in the Earth's environment and contribute to catastrophic events leading to mass extinctions. The concept proposes that during specific periods when the solar system is positioned further 
from the galactic habitability zone, there could be increased risk of disruptions to Earth's systems, including climate change, increased cosmic radiation exposure, or other cosmic influences that might negatively impact life on Earth. The geological record does show evidence of major extinction events throughout Earth's history, but actually bringing these events slowly to the Sun's position within the Milky Way spiral arms is challenging to confirm. Pterosaurs could not walk. This theory, proposed by C.D. Bramwell and G.R. Whitfield in 1974, suggests that pterosaurs were incapable of supporting their body weight on the ground and instead became airborne by sliding off cliffs on their stomachs. Their hypothesis was based on the anatomical structure of pterosaurs, specifically their limb proportions and wing structure. They proposed that due to their biomechanics and proportions of their limbs, pterosaurs might have faced difficulties in walking or taking off from the ground. According to his theory, instead of taking off from a standing position, pterosaurs might have used alternative methods such as launching themselves off cliffs or elevated surfaces. The idea was that they would rely on gravity and momentum, sliding down surfaces to become airborne, somewhat similar to the way penguins on land use their bodies to propel themselves forward. While it's true that pterosaurs had unique anatomical features, the idea that they were entirely incapable of walking or taking off the ground isn't really accepted. Bird Stem Hemotherm The concept that birds and mammals share a common ancestor classified as stem hemotherm or stem ammonite is a minority of speculative view in evolutionary biology. Richard Owen, a prominent 19th century biologist and paleontologist, proposed a taxonomic category called hemothermia, which encompassed birds and animals, suggesting certain similarities between these groups. However, modern evolutionary biology and paleontology have since established that birds and mammals evolved along separate evolutionary paths from different reptilian ancestors. The idea of a shared ancestor between birds and mammals resurfaced though in the late 20th century, notably in the work of scientists like Sorian Lofthrop, Brian Gardiner, and Philip Janvier. These researchers proposed the concept of a stem amnionite that could have given rise to both birds and mammals in ancient evolutionary history. This hypothesis suggests the existence of a hypothetical ancestor group that preceded the diversions of birds and mammals within the larger context of vertebrate evolution. The stem ammonite was envisioned as a creature possessing certain characteristics or features common to both birds and mammals, which later evolved into the distinct lineages we recognize today. This illustration by Philippe Janvier represents a speculative depiction of what such an ancient creature might have looked like based on evolutionary relationships. Fossils in European Devil Lore In European folklore and historical beliefs, there were instances where fossils and certain natural phenomena were associated with superstitions and beliefs, involving the devil and witchcraft. Basically, fossilized creatures or unusual geological specimens sometimes played a role in cultural narratives and were linked to supernatural or demonic explanations. During the medieval and early modern periods, when scientific understanding was limited, and superstitions were common, people often encountered fossils and unfamiliar geological formations. These discoveries were often misunderstood or interpreted within the framework of religious beliefs, folklore, and superstitions which were present at the time. In some cases, unusual fossils or ancient remains found on Earth were perceived as straight up monstrous or mysterious creatures of the past. There are beliefs that associate these remnants with devilish activities, actually bringing their origins to mythical beings or demons. Such interpretations were sometimes incorporated into artistic depictions or stories, reflecting the prevailing cultural beliefs. An example is the Witch's Sabbath with Reconstructed Skeleton of Monster by Marco Antonio Raimondi, which is an artistic representation from the 16th century that reflects these beliefs. In this artwork, the illustration depicts a scene involving witches and a reconstructed or assembled skeleton of a monstrous creature. Gracilosaurus Madness Gracilosaurus, named after discoverer Amans Gressley is a genus of Plateosaur and Sauropodomorph dinosaur that lived during the late Triassic period around 214 to 204 million years ago. The story of Gressliosaurus intertwines with the tragic tale of its discoverer, Gressley, a Swiss geologist and paleontologist who made significant contributions to the field of stratigraphy and paleoecology. He introduced the use of the term facies in geology and is considered one of the founders of modern stratigraphy and paleoecology. Gressley worked as an assistant to Louis Agassiz and made important geological observations in the Jura Mountain. Unfortunately though, Gressley suffered from mental health issues, and not only that, but Agassiz betrayed Gressley and stole some of his fossils, causing him to live a reclusive life before being institutionalized in an asylum in 1864. His friend and fellow paleontologist Oswald Heer visited him in this asylum and later wrote that Gressley, and I'll quote what he said, was agonized by the thought that he had transformed 
into this Gracilosaurus. It's a sad story, but it goes to show the close relationship some scientists can have with their work, to the extent that it becomes a defining part of their identity. Tung Ho Dolo Louis Dolo, a prominent Belgian paleontologist, just the presence of an opening in the lower jaw of Iguanodon, believing it to be an adaption for the tongue. He proposed that this opening might have accommodated a retractable, chameleon-like tongue that Iguanodon could extend to reach vegetation. Dole's idea was an attempt to explain the feeding behavior of Iguanodon, based on the fossil evidence available at the time. Later scientific investigation and closer examination of Iguanodon fossils revealed that the supposed opening Dolo described in the lower jaw was actually an artifact or a crack in the fossil rather than a natural anatomical feature of the dinosaur. Subsequent studies and re-examinations of Iguanodon demonstrated that Dolo's interpretation regarding the tongue hole was incorrect. Despite the error in Dolo's interpretation, his idea was incorporated into several textbooks and scientific illustrations before it was corrected. Telliard Psychical Research, Griffinfly Sciences An important paleoentomologist made significant contributions to the study of insect evolution in the early 20th century. He also had a lifelong interest in the occult, which intersected with his scientific pursuits. Tilliard's fascination with the flight mechanics of giant griffin flies led him to visit mediums in an attempt to observe the behavior of these prehistoric insects in spiritual form. Despite his interest in psychical research, Tilliard maintained a skeptical stance. When a medium predicted his death in a car crash within the next 10 years, Tilliard expressed skepticism about such psychic foresight. However, in a tragic turn of events, Tilliard was killed in a car accident in 1937. His involvement in psychical research and his scientific work reflect the complex and multifaceted nature of his interests and pursuits. Comsignatus fins The claim that Comsignatus had flippers instead of grasping claws was initially described by Alan Bedar and Gerald Tommel in 1972. They proposed the existence of a new species, Comsignatus coralistris, with modified dolphin-like flippers envisioning it as a semi-aquatic animal. However, it was later determined that the fossil had been geologically distorted giving the appearance of flattened flippers when in reality it wasn't part of the actual animal. This discovery debunked the initial claim, but not before it had influenced some popular paleo art and media representations, creating some pretty cool depictions of what it looked like. Essentially, the idea of complex Ignatius having flippers was based on the misinterpretation of the fossil evidence, and it has since been corrected in scientific understanding. Who Lies Sleeping? Who Lies Sleeping is a book by Rex and Rita Stanford that goes into unconventional and speculative theories regarding pre-human civilizations and suggests the existence of a Saurian pre-human society. This book presents hypotheses suggesting that this ancient civilization was capable of advanced technology and might have met its end through nuclear warfare. Also, it suggests the existence of a secretive, dinosaur-like ruling elite or cable that might still have influence in modern times. The ideas explored in Who Lies Sleeping touch upon speculative concepts such as Saurian humanoid species often referred to as dinosauroids, which we introduced in Tier 1. Theories of ancient civilizations predating recorded human history and the potential connection between dinosaurs and certain concepts found in fringe theories like UFO lore and CU archaeology. These speculative concepts include notions like biorapturism, which are described as predatory creatures resembling dinosaurs, AV sapiens that suggest bird-like intelligent beings, and the idea that dinosaurs might be linked to alleged extraterrestrial or supernatural entities such as greys or reptoids, if anyone remembers that entry. I'll link this book down too if anyone wants to explore more of these conspiracy theories. Paleodictyon The Cambrian period, approximately 541 to 485 million years ago, is best known for the Cambrian explosion, a significant diversification of life forms. During this time, mysterious fossil traces resembling hexagonal honeycombs known as Paleodictyon have been found on the Cambrian seabed. These mysterious traces have sparked some scientific interest and debate. Seemingly recent examples of these traces have been discovered, which brought a suggestion that live specimens could still exist today. However, the creature associated with these traces also remains unknown, linked to two main theories. The first theory suggests that the traces are the direct bodily imprint of something like a polyop or sponge, while the second theory proposes that they are tunnel systems or burrows for an as of yet unknown animal. Additionally, the possibility that Paleodictyon is an abiotic formation, known as a pseudofossil, has also been suggested. So basically, the study of Pelodictyon and the ongoing debate surrounding its origins is still a mystery of the ancient world. Pedum caused by pre-human civilization The Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or Pedum, is a period occurring around 56 million years ago, known for its significant global warming event. During this period, there was a rapid release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, 
linked to substantial warming, ocean acidification, and changes in ecosystems. Some theories, such as the Silurian hypothesis, suggest the possibility of ancient pre-human civilizations that might have existed in deep time, even during periods like the Petten. Proponents of this hypothesis have suggested that the sudden increase in fossil carbons during the Petten could potentially be attributed to carbon fuel used by an ancient civilization, similar to how humans use fossil fuels today. And remember how the thought experiment also says that finding direct evidence, such as technological artifacts, is unlikely due to the rarity of fossilization and the constant changes on Earth's surface. Therefore, the sudden increase in fossil carbon during the Petten could for sure indicate the use of carbon fuels by an ancient civilization. But right now, there's no strong evidence to support this claim, so it remains an interesting theory out there. Noogenesis The concept of noogenesis is associated with Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a French philosopher, paleontologist, and Jesuit priest who proposed the idea of an evolutionary process that involves the emergence and development of consciousness in the universe. Teilhard de Chardin was the one that introduced the concept of the megapoint, which again represents the theoretical endpoint or culmination of cosmic evolution. According to his theory, the universe is evolving toward a complex state of consciousness and unity, which he termed the megapoint. Noogenesis refers to an evolutionary process through which consciousness emerges and evolves. Teilhard de Chardin argued that consciousness, particularly human consciousness, is not merely an accidental outcome, but an integral part of the universe's evolution. He proposed that as life evolved, consciousness emerged, leading to the development of the noosphere. The noosphere refers to a sphere or realm of human thought and collective consciousness, encompassing the entirety of human intellectual activity, knowledge, and interconnectedness. Teilhard de Chardin envisioned the noosphere as a stage in the evolution of Earth where human consciousness and communication become increasingly interconnected and influential. According to Teilhard de Chardin's philosophical and theological perspective, the noosphere, representing the collective human consciousness, would continue to evolve and eventually converge into a higher level of unity and spiritual fulfillment known as Christogenesis. This concept suggests that the evolutionary process leads to a transcendent stage of unity and spiritual realization which you can tell from the name he associated with the teachings of Christ. Dark Matter Killed the Dinosaurs Lisa Randall, Michael Rampino, and Michael Reese, among other scientists, have explored ideas linking dark matter to a mass extinction events in Earth's history, including the extinction of the dinosaurs. Dark matter, a mysterious invisible substance that doesn't emit or interact with electromagnetic radiation, makes a significant portion of the universe's mass. However, it's only been observed indirectly through its gravitational effects on visible matter. The proposed hypothesis suggests various ways which dark matter might have affected Earth, potentially leading to mass extinctions. One hypothesis proposes as the solar system orbits the galaxy, it might periodically pass through regions of space containing dense clumps or concentrations of dark matter. These encounters could potentially disturb the orbits of comets or asteroids in the Oort cloud, leading to increased impacts on Earth and triggering mass extinction events. Other speculative ideas suggest that Earth's orbit might intersect with specific regions or planes of dark matter, causing gravitational disturbances that could disrupt the stability of the solar system or lead to increased cosmic impacts. Alien Space Viruses Cause Evolution Hoyle. Sir Fred Hoyle, a prominent astronomer and cosmologist, proposed some unorthodox ideas about the role of extraterrestrial viruses in the evolution of life on Earth. Hoyle, along with Chandra Wickramasinghe, were the ones that developed the hypothesis called panspermia, which again suggests that life exists throughout the universe and is distributed by comets, meteorites, or interstellar dust carrying microorganisms, including viruses. Their life cloud theory speculated that these cosmic agents, such as viruses or other microscopic life forms, continually rain down on Earth from space. They proposed that these extraterrestrial viral particles arriving from cosmic deliveries could have influenced the course of evolution and played a significant role in the development of life on our planet. Hoya and Wickramasinghe suggested that these spaceborne viruses could have triggered rapid mutations in organisms upon arrival, potentially leading to evolutionary changes and even mass extinctions. They proposed that viral infections from space might have caused the transformation of certain ancient life forms, such as dinosaurs or pterosaurs, into different species including mammals and birds, particularly during significant extinction events like the end Cretaceous extinction that marked the end of the dinosaurs. The Namelosphere The concept of the Namelosphere was proposed by Randolph Kirkpatrick, a sponge geologist in 1912. Kirkpatrick's theory suggests that the Earth's crust was formed from the accumulated remains of millions of years' worth of foraminifera shells, specifically a type of large, dish-shaped foraminifera known as nummulites. Foraminifera are a diverse group of single-celled organisms, often with shells made of calcium carbonate, that are abundant in marine environments. 
Nummulites are a specific genus of large, lens-shaped foraminifera that live during the Paleogene and Eogene epochs and are known for their distinctive coin-like appearance. Kirkpatrick proposed that the vast accumulation of pneumolites over immense periods of time formed layers of sedimentary rock, contributing to the structure of the Earth's crust. He envisioned that these ancient foraminifera, through their continuous deposition and accumulation, played a fundamental role in the formation of geological strata and the shaping of the planet's surface. Overactive pituitary gland killed dinosaurs. Franz Baranowska, an influential and somewhat eccentric figure in paleontology, proposed an intriguing theory about the potential role of overactive pituitary glands in the extinction of dinosaurs. Nopska suggested that dinosaurs may have suffered from conditions related to the pituitary gland, leading to giant sizes and resulting in evolutionary disadvantages that contributed to their demise. Nopska's theory of evolutionary inertia basically suggested that the pituitary gland responsible for secreting growth hormones might have been overactive in certain dinosaur species. According to his hypothesis, this overactivity of the pituitary gland could have caused dinosaurs to grow to exceptionally large sizes, which in turn led to certain psychological and ecological disadvantages. He theorized that the disproportionately large sizes of some dinosaurs might have hindered their ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions, making them less flexible or agile compared to smaller species. To be honest, the first time I heard this, I merely thought about T-Rex and its arms compared to his body, maybe because of all the memes out there. I remember when some of my friends would poke at this one friend for having small arms, calling them T-Rex arms. Anyways, Nopska essentially believed that this evolutionary disadvantage, combined with environmental changes and other factors, could have contributed to the extinction of these giant creatures. In his research, Nopska examined various fossilized brain cases, searching for evidence of an enlarged pituitary gland in dinosaurs. Although his theory was really unique and interesting, it lacked empirical evidence, and the study of internal structures in fossilized remains was pretty limited during its time. Flying Dimetrodon Pairs Alright, to be honest, I couldn't really find anything on this entry when searching it up besides like a Reddit post, and I don't really know the whole context behind it, but from everyone's responses, I'm guessing it was like a joke or like an April Fool's thing, but yeah, that's pretty much all we have about the entry, so next entry. Fossil of the Witness to the Deluge Johann Jacob Swedger, a Swiss nationalist, scholar, and physician, published the book in 1726 titled Homo Dilvi Testis, Man Witness to the Deluge. In his book, Swedger described what he believed to be the fossilized remains of a human, suggesting that was evidence of a person who perished during the great flood described in the Bible. Swedger saw it as basically the historical proof of the biblical flood. This interpretation aligned with his religious beliefs and his attempt to find scientific evidence supporting the biblical narrative. However, when his claims were eventually analyzed by scientific research, it revealed that the fossilized bones he identified as a human actually belonged to an extinct giant salamander. The misidentification was corrected in 1811 when the French anatomist Georges Cuvier correctly identified the fossil as an ancient amphibian. So Swetzer's case is often brought up as an example of an early misinterpretation of fossils because of religious or preconceived beliefs. Godzillas the Godzilla's fossil is a mysterious discovery that was unearthed in northern Kentucky by amateur paleontologist Ron Fine. The fossil, which dates back 450 million years, was found in the Cincinnati region, which was once covered by shallow seas making a favorable location for fossil discoveries. The fossil is approximately 3.5 feet wide and 6.5 feet long, making a significant and unusual find. The fossil is an unusual texture created by a directional pattern on its surface and was found with small animal fossils attached to it, known as tribulites which may provide clues necessary for the fossil's eventual identification. The discovery has stumped scientists though, and believe it or not, they're still trying to find its identity. The fossil has been subject of scientific study and debate, and its unique characteristics have led to various theories and speculations about it. And to be honest, the first time I heard this fossil, I thought it was going to be like super huge and like scary monster like Godzilla, but yeah, it's not really the case. Earth periodically restocks extinct animals. This entry is about the theory that Earth periodically restocks extinct animals, as proposed by John Michael and Robert Rickard. The theory attempts to explain the rediscovery of certain animals thought to be extinct, like the example of the Bermuda petrel, which was thought to have been exterminated in the 17th century, only for a colony to be rediscovered in 1951. Michael and Rickard extend the theory to cryptozoological appearances of saurians and ape men, suggesting that creatures now extinct contain the hot regions and phantom form, with occasional real, physical appearances until the time comes to re-establish themselves. This theory, while not supported by scientific evidence, still raises some pretty interesting questions about extinction and the rediscovery of species. The theory of periodic restocking of extinct species, although speculative, 
goes to show the mysterious nature of the fossil record sometimes, and how new discoveries can change things in an instant. It's pretty cool to think that for 100 years, a creature could be believed to be extinct, and then like randomly discovery proves that we were all wrong. Biraptor and Evolutionary Bioparanoia The concept of Biraptor McLaughlinii, as proposed by John McLaughlin in 1984, is a hypothetical creature that pretty much goes beyond mainstream science and into speculative fiction. McLaughlin's idea of a Biraptor envisions a creature resembling a sapient raptor or dinosauroid, which he presented as a more reasonable version compared to previous renditions. He described it as having a saurian appearance while still possessing an otherworldly or alien-like quality. McLaughlin used this hypothetical creature as part of a thought experiment discussing lost pre-human civilizations during the Mesozoic era. In his broad theory termed evolutionary bioparanoia, McLaughlin suggests that civilizations including hypothetical ancient ones are short-lived on geological timescales and leave minimal evidence of their existence. He proposed that these civilizations, like the hypothetical Bioraptor society, might have led to their own downfall through actions such as mass agriculture, excessive mineral extraction, environmental degradation, and even nuclear warfare, ultimately causing their own extinction. The idea of lost pre-human civilizations leaving minimal trace in the geological record has been brought up a few times actually in this iceberg chart, but with all the theories out there, it's still largely speculative. Sturkfontein Cave Psychometry The Sturkfontein Cave Psychometry is about the involvement of a psychic, Jeffrey Hodson, in an archaeological research project at the Starkfontein Caves, where the bones of the first discovered Australopithecus were found. Jeffrey Hodson, a member of the Theosophical Society, performed psychometry on the fossil remains at the caves. We introduced this topic earlier and for a quick recap, it basically involves obtaining psychic impressions from an object. Hodson claimed to have recorded ghostly sounds imprinted on the fossils, which he interpreted as the horrified screams of a caveman's final moments. This dual collaboration between a psychic and a paleontologist concerning it was of such a significant archaeological site led to some interest in discussion, since it blended both science and the paranormal. It comes up sometimes in the ongoing debate about the role of psychics in archaeological and paleontological research. Vascular Plants Evolved from Inside Out Legends Peter Astet's 1988 hypothesis proposing an unconventional origin for vascular plants offers a pretty interesting departure from the mainstream understanding of plant evolution. Astas suggested an alternative idea challenging the prevalent view that modern land plants descended from algae. Instead, he proposed a concept involving the symbiotic merger of a majority of algae with a mineral scavenging fungi component, resulting in an ancestral organism with distinct characteristics, or otherwise an inside-out structure where the majority of the organism was algae and the interior contained fungi. This idea suggests a departure from the typical understanding of lichens where fungi dominate the symbiotic relationship. Basically, Atsa's proposition presents a reverse scenario where the algae constitute the primary component, contrasting with the commonly observed structure of modern lichens. The hypothesis opens intriguing possibilities regarding the complexity of plant evolution and the potential for different symbiotic relationships to have played a role in shaping the characteristics of early plant ancestors. Longuisquama feathers were just leaves. The mysterious reptile Longuisquama from the Triassic period has intrigued scientists due to its distinct feature, that being long feather-like structures along its back. These structures, resembling elongated hockey-shaped quills or scales, have sparked a few fringe theories about their nature and purpose. One of these theories presents an alternative explanation, suggesting that what appears to be feathers on Langusquama were in fact leaves or plant matter accidentally preserved with the fossilized remains. Their argument primarily relies on the observation that in only just one fossil specimen, are the presumed feathers directly associated with the animal's body. In other cases, the feather-like structures were found separately, not in connection with the animal's remains. So you can see how it actually does make a reasonable theory, like if I was a paleontologist, I'd probably think the same. However, the fact is though, this interpretation still remains controversial for several reasons. Firstly, the mode of preservation observed in Longuiscoma fossils is inconsistent with the preservation of plant material. Additionally, attempts to identify these supposed leaves with any known plants from the Triassic era have not been successful, casting doubt on the theory. Lacat Subterra Erosion Theory Claude Nicolas Lacat, a French surgeon in the 18th century, proposed an unconventional theory about the Earth's structure and its eventual fate. In 1744, Lacat introduced the concept of subterranean erosion, suggesting that Earth was gradually collapsing inward due to erosion occurring beneath the surface. According to his theory, this ongoing erosion would eventually hollow out the Earth entirely. Lacat's hypothesis implied a cyclic process, reflecting his belief in reoccurrence or repetition in natural phenomena. He envisioned a future where the Earth would collapse inward completely, 
and result in a hollow interior. Following this complete collapse, Lacat believed that the Earth would re-emerge, restarting the process of erosion and collapse once again. This theory presented by Lacat was really unconventional for its time, and served as a great contrast to the prevailing scientific understanding of geology and the Earth's structure. His theory ended up gaining not much traction within the scientific community. Over time, advancements in geology and Earth sciences have provided alternative, evidence-based explanations for the Earth's structure and processes, which again don't align with Lacat's theory. Dinosaurs were going extinct before the meteor. The study led by Fabian Lacondamine and colleagues in 2021 presents a really interesting perspective suggesting that dinosaurs might have actually been experiencing a decline even before the famous meteor impact event, which everyone knows about. The study's findings challenge a long-held assumption that the meteor impact was the sole cause of the demise of non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. Kahnemann's research points to a significant decline in herbivores non-avian dinosaurs towards the end of the Cretaceous era. They suggest that this decline might have been influenced by specific factors, such as the dominance of hadrosaurs, a type of herbivorous dinosaur, potentially outcompeting other herbivores, leading to a reduction in overall diversity among herbivorous dinosaurs. Also, the study suggests that the risk of extinction among these dinosaurs might have been associated with the age of species during this decline. This finding implies that certain species might have been less adaptable or lacked evolutionary novelty necessary to cope with changing environmental conditions, thereby making them more vulnerable to extinction. Preformatationism Preformatationism is a historical idea about the development of organisms, mostly in medieval and early modern times. It proposed that all living beings were preformed during the initial creation of the Earth, existing in miniature form within their parents. This concept suggested that within each being reside a fully formed and tiny version of themselves, which would grow and develop through maturation rather than originating from an embryo or seed. The notion of preformatationism had historical roots, with some early proponents including the poet naturalist Lucretius from the late Roman Empire. Who knew people were interested in paleo even back then? Lucretius formulated a theory that all species didn't evolve but were born directly from the Earth's surface. He proposed that the Earth, when young and vigorous, could give birth to myriad giant and exotic creatures. According to Lucretius, the seeds or atoms of every conceivable creature were stored within the Earth's womb, and as Earth aged, it lost its vitality to produce large creatures resulting in the emergence of smaller ones directly from the soil. This early concept resembles a form of preformatationism, where the existence of organisms was thought to be preordained and inherent in the Earth's composition from its inception. It attributed the origin and development of living beings to a predetermined blueprint within nature, rather than through the process of embryonic development or evolutionary change. Pterosaurs couldn't fly. Right, so this is a pretty wild claim that pterosaurs could not fly, as was suggested by Katsufumi Sato's research. Sato's studies use accelerometers attached to the wings of albatrosses to calculate the necessary wingspan to weight ratio for flight, and he concluded that even conservative reconstructions of large pterosaurs, such as Quetzalcoatlus, were too heavy to fly or glide. However, those who argued against this theory claimed that the comparison to albatrosses is misleading and arbitrarily selected. Recent studies have provided new insights into pterosaur flight capabilities. For instance, an international team of scientists used imaging techniques to uncover details of pterosaur soft tissue, and their modeling suggested that certain pterosaurs had the capability to launch themselves from water. Also, quantitative tests have been used to assess the flight potential of hatchling pterosaurs, with some studies suggesting that even little hatchlings, well maybe not little considering the insane size of pterosaurs, had the capacity for sustained far-reaching glides. But the unique flight-related anatomy of pterosaurs such as their long, tapering wings and hollow bones is still being researched. Therefore, the debate over pterosaur flight capabilities still continues. Breeding stones This idea is about the concept of stones, fossils, or minerals engaging in a form of reproduction or birth that's existed across some historical and cultural contexts. This notion, known as breeding stones, proposes that these geological objects have the ability to copulate or generate offspring, like organic life forms. In the 18th century, Michael Valentini, a scientific authority of that time, proposed a theory that stones could breed or reproduce deep within the earth. Similar ideas were also persistent in folklore and cultural traditions across Europe. For instance, in Irish and English folklore, there were beliefs surrounding revered boulders known as rock mothers. These boulders were thought to possess small hollows from which smaller stones were believed to be born. The belief was that these smaller stones in turn could produce more stones, symbolizing a form of reproduction within the natural world. When I was working on my ancient structures video a while back, stones were actually pretty common in the entries like the Easter Island statues. So after researching a bunch of those topics, I can see how people of ancient times could attribute these beliefs to rocks or stones. 
Harley Garbani ESP. Harley Garbani, an amateur fossil hunter, was renowned for his exceptional ability to discover unique fossils. He attributed his success to a heightened sense of intuition, which he believed guided him to these finds. Even professional paleontologists were amazed at the effectiveness of Garbani's intuition, with some suggesting that it bordered on what could be considered as actual telepathic insight or extrasensory perception, or other words ESP like the entry says. Garbani's discoveries, which include significant dinosaur finds, were highly regarded in the paleontological community. His work has left a lasting impact and his prime fossil finds are on display, and his prime fossil finds are on display at prestigious institutions. Some of these include the Natural History Museum at Los Angeles, the University of California Museum of Paleontology, and the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Even though he was an amateur, Gavani's work was the envy of professionals, and he was revered by scientists who spoke in near mystical terms of his ability for finding fossils. Linksia Cheetah The Linksia Cheetah, also known as Asininix Cortini, was a shocking discovery of a primitive cheetah skull from China. The fossil was initially reported to be one of the oldest cheetah fossils ever found, with an estimated age of approximately 2.2 to 2.5 million years. The discovery was published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, which was a pretty big deal. However, the authenticity of the fossil was soon called into question by other scientists, who alleged that the skull was a hoax, with parts composed of plaster. Even though there is a controversy, the article was not retracted until 2012, and the authors maintained that they didn't mean to deliberately hoax anyone. The case of the Linksia cheetah in turn helped highlight the real problem of fakes and the murkiness of the fossil supply chains, especially in the black market fossil trade. To be honest, I didn't even know there was a black market fossil trade. The fossil was ultimately accepted as a forgery in 2012 and is now considered a discredited specimen. Primeval Universal Ocean Abraham Werner's concept of the universal ocean proposed in 1787 was a significant idea in the field of geology during its earlier years. Werner, a prominent geologist, just that the Earth's surface was initially covered by a vast and all-encompassing ocean termed the Universal Ocean. According to Werner's theory, this ocean was responsible for shaping the Earth's geological formations. The Neptunism theory put forward by Werner proposed that the various geological strata observed on the Earth's surface were formed as the Universal Ocean gradually receded over extended periods. As the water diminished, it revealed the underlying sea floor and left behind layers of sedimentary material. Werner attributed the creation of these geological strata to the accumulation of loose mineral materials that were deposited due to the actions of waves and storms within the universal ocean. Werner's Neptunism theory was foundational in the early discourse of geology, creating debate and serving as a contrast to the competing theory of Plutonism. Plutonism, advocated by James Hutton and others, proposed that geological formations were primarily a result of volcanic activity and the eternal heat of the earth rather than the actions of water. Spermatic Theory of Fossils the spermatic theory was a historical concept centered on the idea that fossils, particularly fossilized animals or the remains found in rocks, were formed by the impregnation of inanimate matter, like rocks or minerals, by some form of organic seeds or material similar to sperm. This theory emerged in a time when scientific understanding of geological and biological processes was super early. The concept was based on a belief that the existence of an amniotic earth or earth womb, a notion that the earth itself had reproductive powers similar to living organisms. According to this theory, it was suggested that the earth possessed generative qualities and that under specific circumstances, mineral substances could incubate or foster the growth of organic material, resembling seeds or germs, and which would lead to the formation of fossils within the rocks. The term spermatic originates from the belief that these organic entities could give rise to new life forms or that they contained the potential for life. However, this concept was a speculative and non-scientific explanation for the origin of fossils. It was proposed in an era when the study of geology and biology lacked much research. A lot of these old theories I feel like people could have made movies out of, since they are pretty creative in my opinion. Humans equal pig chimp hybrid. Alright so this one I could definitely say belongs on this weird paleontology iceberg chart. Eugene McCarthy, a genesis with a PhD, has proposed a controversial theory suggesting that modern humans are the result of interbreeding between pigs and ape-like animals millions of years ago. This theory also known as the chimp-pig hybrid theory, suggests that multiple hybridization events took place at different times, producing different hominid species that we now know. McCarthy provides a list of anatomical evidence to support his theory. He points out similarities seen between humans and pigs, like our high infertility compared to other animals, our stomach valves, and hairlessness. He also connects that humans and pigs share similar organ and skin structures. McCarthy's theory isn't really based on genetic sequence comparisons though, 
and it's said simply anatomical. This theory has been met with a bunch of criticism, as you might presume, and skepticism from the scientific community. One of the main criticisms is that pigs and chimpanzees have a different number of chromosomes, making the idea of a pig-chimp hybrid not possible. Critics also argue that the theory requires interbreeding between separate orders of animals, which is highly unlikely. Kluski Ape Man Seance In 1919, during a seance, which is basically like a meeting for people to try to talk to spirits, which was held by Franek Kluski, a well-known medium, there was a claim of an unusual presence. Kluski was actually reputed for summoning ghostly figures during these spiritual sessions. In this particular seance, a figure representing Pithecanthropus appeared. Pithecanthropus was once thought to be a kind of missing link between humans and apes, and was said to look like a gibbon-like ape-man with shaggy, coarse hair. According to a witness, Cole Nerber Okolowisk, the apartion was remarkably strong, capable of moving heavy furniture and lifting people while seated in their chairs. Despite its intimidating appearance and behavior, the entity was reported to be non-harmful, often showing goodwill and readiness to obey. The pithecanthropus is essentially an outdated term that was historically used to describe what we now know as Homo erectus, an extinct species of early humans. The term was coined in the late 19th century by Eugene Dubius after the discovery of the first Homo erectus remains in Java, Indonesia. The story of the pithecanthropus tulpa is an example of the early 20th century spiritualism and the fascination with the possibility of contacting spirits or entities from different times. Agassiz's Fish Dream Louis Agassiz was a renowned 19th century scientist who encountered a challenging fossilized fish specimen that was partially obscured by rock. As he was struggling on how to extract it without causing damage, Agassiz experienced a series of dreams over three nights. In these dreams, he saw the complete form of the fish with all its features. Initially, he couldn't remember the details upon awakening, but on the third night, he was prepared with a pencil and paper by his bed. After dreaming of the fish again, he quickly sketched what he had seen in the dream. The next morning, he found that the sketch included details he hadn't consciously realized were possible for the fossil. Using the sketch as a guide, Agassiz was able to carefully chisel away the stone and successfully reveal the fish fossil, which matched the image from his dream. This fossil turned out to be a really important discovery and was later included in a significant work on paleontology, the Spoisson's Fossils, published in 1843. To be honest, that is actually pretty wild, thinking a dream was the ultimate reason for the proper carving of the fossil. I don't know too much about neuroscience, but I think we still don't really know too much about dreams, so accounts like these make the mysteries about it even more cool. Nessie is a giant Tully monster. Loch Ness Monster is a really famous cryptid I'm sure everyone has heard of. Also on the topic of cryptids, after this series is done, I'll definitely try to look around for a good iceberg chart I could cover, so expect that very soon, I got ya. Anyways, Ted Holliday, a former angler and Loch Ness Monster who transitioned into a passionate investigator of the mysterious creature known as Nessie, proposed an intriguing theory in his book, The Worm of Loch Ness. He put forward the idea that the mysterious Loch Ness Monster was in fact a colossal Tully monster, a prehistoric creature famously referred to as the Tully monster. Holiday's theory about Nessie being a Tully monstrum was quite unconventional. Also, it gets even more interesting where he speculated about the possibility of underwater time portals, suggesting that the creature could pass through these portals in the depths of the Loch Ness. As Holiday's investigation progressed, his viewpoints even evolved. Over time, he started to see Nessie as more of a supernatural entity than a physical being. Supernova Kill Dinosaurs The supernova theory proposing the extinction of dinosaurs was suggested by Dale Russell and Willis Tucker in 1971. They speculated that a nearby exploding star, or supernova, might have been responsible for the demise of dinosaurs. This idea gained attention when scientists discovered higher than usual deposits of iridium on the cretaceous pelagene boundary strata about 10 years later. The background on iridium is basically it's relatively rare on Earth's surface, but it's found in higher concentrations on objects like asteroids and comets. This theory held promise as the iridium deposits seemed to support the idea of a massive cosmic event such as a supernova explosion contributing to extinction. However, the theory later faced challenges as scientists expected to find plutonium, another element associated with cosmic events, alongside the iridium deposits. When researchers failed to find the anticipated plutonium, it casted doubts on the validity of this explanation. As a result, the supernova theory, while fascinating, lost its credibility as a primary explanation for the dinosaur extinction. Odin Stolvo Giant Brains in 1925, a remarkable discovery in a Moscow coal quarry near Adesovo railway station made headlines. Two objects resembling giant fossilized brains were found. Dr. N. Grigorovich initially identified these as unusually large human brains, a claim supported by French anonymous B.K. Hinzi, triggering widespread curiosity and debate. The suggestion that these objects could be human brains from the Carboniferous period intrigued many scientists. 
the idea of brain tissue volatilizing over such an extensive period would have been extremely rare, so it's kind of like a miracle. As the news circulated, the scientific community grew increasingly doubtful about the identification. Questions arose about how soft and perishable brain tissue could survive millions of years. Some scientists proposed alternative explanation, suggesting that the specimens might have been misidentified elephant brains, or plant matter with resemblance to brains. Chi Ang Gu Chi Ang Gu, a Malaysian researcher, gained attention for his unconventional claims in paleontology. He asserts that he has identified numerous baby dinosaurs by interpreting rocks with shapes that resemble juvenile reptiles. Gu refers to his unique approach as petrified embryology, a self-proclaimed new field in paleontological study. However, Gu's claims have not gained widespread acceptance within the scientific community. Many paleontologists are skeptical of his methodology and findings, as they often lack scientific evidence or consensus to support his interpretations. Their interpretation of rock formations as representing embryonic or juvenile dinosaurs requires substantial and verifiable evidence, which Gu's work has yet to provide. So yeah, that's basically about the entry. I didn't really find too much on this topic on the internet, besides like a blog from Chi and Gu explaining how he's still trying to get evidence and stuff for his theory. Pangenesis Gemulus Pangenesis was a theory proposed by Charles Darwin to explain the process of heredity before the discovery of genes. Darwin recognized the importance of environmental factors and random variations in the evolutionary process, but he lacked a clear understanding of how traits were physically transmitted from parents to offspring. In an attempt to bridge this gap, he formulated the provisional concept of pangenesis. Darwin postulated that the body cells share gemulus, or living atoms containing heredity information that circulate throughout an organism's body and eventually gathered in the reproductive organs. These gemules were then believed to be passed down to the next generation, determining the traits of the offspring. Despite Darwin's efforts, pangenesis faced skepticism even among his contemporaries. Darwin himself had doubts about the theory, and it was never fully embraced by supporters of the scientific community. Cometary Earth Theory William Whiston's new theory of Earth proposed a unique explanation for major historical events, aligning them with literal interpretations of the Bible. In 1696, Whiston suggested that comets were the primary cause beyond catastrophic occurrences in Earth's history. His theory attributed significant events such as the fall of man described in Genesis to specific comet impacts. According to Whiston, a comet striking the earth initiated the rotational motion mentioned in the biblical narrative of humanity's descent. He further linked cometary impacts to the biblical story of Noah's flood and other historical events like the plague of Egypt. Remarkably, he even associated everyday weather events such as rain with the influence of comets. Despite his elaborate connections between comets and historical events, Whiston's ideas were considered heretical during his time. His contemporaries, including the renowned scientist Isaac Newton, did not fully embrace his theories. Whiston's work foreshadowed concepts that would emerge in later centuries, like the Shiva hypothesis, the Nemesis and Nibiru theories, and the works of Emanuel Vilankovsky. Aquatic Pterosaurs In 1784, Cosimo Alessandro Calini reconstructed pterosaur fossils and suggested that these creatures were aquatic, envisioning them as animals that swam using their wings as paddles. This idea persisted until around 1830. During this time, Johann George Wagler proposed a theory that grouped pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and plesiosaurs together as ancestral monotremes. Monotremes are egg-laying mammals like the platypus and echidnas. Weger speculated that these ancient monotremes eventually evolved into marine creatures such as whale and dolphins. Moreover, Wagler specifically proposed that pterosaurs were direct ancestors of dolphins, suggesting a close evolutionary relationship between these flying reptiles and marine mammals. This theory represented a significant attempt to understand the relationships between different ancient animals based on their anatomical features and habits. However, with advancements in paleontology and the discovery of new fossils, scientific understanding has evolved over time. Presently, the idea that pterosaurs were fully aquatic creatures like dolphins is not widely supported in the scientific community. Instead, modern research and findings suggest that pterosaurs were flying reptiles that soared through the skies rather than swimming through the waters. Scrotum Humanum The first scientific description of a dinosaur fossil dates back to 1763 when Richard Brookies examined a megalosaurus femur bone. Back then, without knowledge of dinosaurs, Brookies believed this bone belonged to a giant human. He correctly identified it as a femur, noting its resemblance to human testicles, and humorously labeled it as scrotum humanum. The original name given by Brookies for a megalosaurus, and by extension, all dinosaurs, raised an interesting debate in scientific naming conventions. However, the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature ruled against retaining the name scrotum humanum for megalosaurus. Some paleontologists like Bill Sargent and Beverly Halstead 
along with historians of science like M.J. Rudwick, amusingly agree that dinosaurs should have, by rights, retained the less dignified and comical original title given by Brookies. They see this as a departure from the norm in scientific nomenclature. Jackalope Spider Hoax The Jackalope Spider was a clever hoax on the internet to create a conceiving but entirely fabricated story. In 2015, a photoshopped image started circulating online, depicting a creature that appeared to be a combination of a spider and a jackrabbit, dubbed the Jackalope Spider. The image showed a creature with the body of a spider but with the head and ears of a jackrabbit, leading many to believe that such a bizarre creature existed. However, the image was digitally altered, merging different animal features to create an entirely fictional creature. While the jackalope itself is a mythical creature from American folklore, a cross between a jackrabbit and antelope, the idea of a jackalope spider was a completely invented concept, intended to amuse and deceive people online. The hoax quickly spread across social media and various websites, capturing the attention of many intrigued by its peculiar appearance. However, experts and fact checkers soon debunked the image, clarifying that it was a digitally manipulated creation and not an actual living creature. Suminia Civilization so Suminia is a synapsid from the Permian period, approximately 260 million years ago. The thing that makes it weird is its well-preserved fossils reveal characteristics that were unusual for its time, notably adaptions for an arboreal or tree-dwelling lifestyle. This feature is particularly significant as most synapsids of the Permian era were adapted to life on ground. Also a striking aspect of Suminia is its hand structure. The fossils show hands capable of grasping and clinging, trace reminiscence of those seen in modern primates. These adaptions suggest a lifestyle that involved climbing and maneuvering through trees, a rarity among creatures of its time. The civilization part of this entry comes from speculated theories about Suminia. Because they resembled primates that are really similar to the ones we evolved from, there became theories about a lost civilization of intelligent humanoid Suminia. The most I could really find in this theory was a Reddit post, and people in the comments suggest that, referring back to the Silurian hypothesis, the lost civilization might have left no trace for us to know if they really existed or not. Actuarial Problem in Paleontology the actuarial problem of paleontology introduces a thought-provoking idea about how we understand fossils and evolution. It suggests that because there are so many different fossil species and because scientists often use certain key fossils to figure out the age of other fossils, we might end up seeing patterns of evolution even if evolution didn't actually happen. The idea isn't saying evolution isn't real, instead it's questioning how we interpret fossil evidence. It argues that in science, especially in studying fossils, there's always a chance of making connections that might not actually be there simply because of the huge number of fossils and the methods used to study them. This approach differs from traditional scientific methods, which usually focus on proving something wrong, a principle known as Papyrian falsifiability to test if it's true. Spinophorus is accurate. Spinophorus was actually initially designed as a parody, created by Adrian Wimmer. It depicts Spinosaurus, a well-known dinosaur, in an exaggerated, fully aquatic form resembling a seal with a proboscis. This creation was meant to humorously critique the sometimes overenthusiastic nature of speculative paleo art, where artists and scientists imagine what prehistoric creatures might have looked like. What's really interesting though is the joke took a turn when recent studies, particularly those by Ibrahim and colleagues, began to suggest that Spinosaurus might have actually been more aquatic than previously believed. These new findings included evidence of a laterally compressed, new-like tail and other streamlined features that supported the idea of a Spinosaurus being well adapted to water. This new scientific perspective of Spinosaurus unexpectedly made the concept of a Spinosaurus sort of believable. The exaggerated features of Spinosaurus, while still being far from being an accurate depiction of Spinosaurus, ironically aligned somewhat with these recent scientific revelations. This overlap has led to an interesting phenomenon where some have mistaken the artworks of Spinosaurus for serious reconstructions of the new aquatic oriented Spinosaurus. Humanoid Chirotherium Initially unearthed in Triassic sandstone in Germany in 1934 and later in England, the Chirotherium footprints bore an uncanny resemblance to human hands, complete with imposed thumbs. The debate over these mysterious prints was intense, with various theories proposed about their origin. Initially, some believe these prints belonged to a marsupial, bear, ape, or even an early human ancestor. The most weird theory out there suggests they were from an amphibious, frog-like ancestors of humans living in Triassic swamps. This idea captured the public imagination and influenced various works of fiction and conspiracy theories. It resonated in Carl Capic's War with the Newts, the Gill Man from the Black Lagoon films, and even modern conspiracy theories about reptilians. The mystery began to clear in 1842 when Richard Owen identified the prince as belonging to a giant amphibian, Labyrinthodon. Labyrinthodon itself was a puzzling creature, with tracks suggesting an awkward, cross-legged guy as depicted in Charles Lyell's reconstruction. Eventually though, by the late 1800s, the contestant shifted to tracks being made by the Pseudosuchian called Chirotherium, resembling a bipedal caiman using its thumbs for traction on mudflats. Fossils Visplastica during the medieval and early modern periods, a popular theory about the formation of fossils was centered on the concept of visplastica. 
This notion suggested that fossils were formed by mysterious shaping force within the earth. The idea was in line with the religious and philosophical views of the time, which were hesitant to accept that fossils could be remains of extinct organisms, as it would imply imperfection in God's creations. Theologians argued that a perfect God would not create species destined to go extinct, so fossils were explained as a result of vis plastica rather than being remains of once living organisms. Supporters of vis plastica believed that the sequence of fossil formation was from rock to mineralized fossil to unmineralized fossil. They contended that it was unlikely for processes in the rocks to produce forms similar to living organisms, like sharks' teeth or sea urchins, without divine or mystical intervention. Siberian Keratosaurus The Siberian Keratosaurus is a story that came from Soviet newspapers in the early 20th century. In these reports, living packs of Keratosaurus, which are likely a mistaken reference to Ceratosaurus, a genus of carnivorous dinosaurs, were discovered in Kamchatka, leaving distinct tracks. The story was added with details such as the foot of a recently killed Keratosaurus, allegedly large enough to enclose a man's head, and supposedly captured in a photograph that, however, never made it into English language newspapers. The New York Herald's coverage on the story on December 17, 1922 reflects the context of its time. The newspaper expressed concern over the potential use of these supposed live dinosaurs as biological weapons by the Soviet Union. This would actually be really scary, imagine dinosaurs as weapons. This fear mirrored the broader anxieties of the Cold War period though, where advancements in science and technology by one superpower often sparked paranoia and speculation in the other. This narrative of living dinosaurs in Siberia, while intriguing, doesn't really have any scientific credibility. Period of Far Eastern Mini Creatures Konosuke Okamura, a Japanese amateur paleontologist, proposed a unique and eccentric theory in paleontology. In the 1970s, he claimed to have discovered fossils from the Silurian geological period that include miniature animals ranging from dinosaurs to humans. He reported more than 1,000 extinct mini species, each less than 0.25 millimeters in length, and contended that there have been no significant changes in the bodies of humankind since the Silurian period, except for an increase in size from 3.5 millimeters to 1,700 millimeters. Okamura's findings and theories, however, were not accepted by the mainstream scientific community. His presentations at Japan's paleontology conferences in the 1970s were met with skepticism, and his approach sparked controversy. It was even rumored that an elderly paleontologist became so angered by Okamura's lecture in 1978 that he suffered from high blood pressure and died prematurely. Following these incidents, the paleontology conference changed its rules to ban amateurs, and Okamura turned to overseas colleges and self-publishing for his research. In 1996, Okamura was actually awarded the IG Nobel Prize a satirical prize that honors unusual or trivial achievements in scientific research. Birds Came First Theory The Birds Came First Theory is a complete reimagining of dinosaur evolution, challenging traditional views on the relationship between birds and dinosaurs. This theory has been most notably advocated by George Oldhevsky, who proposed that all dinosaurs descended from a bird-like ancestor capable of flight. According to his theory, the common ancestors of dinosaurs were not a traditional, large reptile-like creature, but rather a smaller, flight-capable bird. Over time, following Cope's law, which is the tendencies for species to grow larger over evolutionary time, these bird-like ancestors evolved into various forms of large, flightless dinosaurs. This perspective turns the conventional understanding of dinosaur evolution on its head, suggesting that features like feathers and other bird-like characteristics were not just present in a few dinosaur species, but were fundamental to all dinosaurs. Gregory Paul, another proponent of a bird-centric view of dinosaur evolution, identified Archaeopteryx, a well-known transitional fossil, as a key link between Triassic birds and later dinosaurs like Dinoinchus. This interpretation positions Archaeopteryx not just as a traditional form between dinosaurs and birds, but as an intermediate stage in the evolution of certain dinosaur species from bird-like ancestors. Goes Ahead Meganura This entry is about the story of Goes Ahead, a crow medicine man and his encounter with a dragonfly-like creature in 1870. During his vision quest in the Wolf Mountain, Goes Ahead reportedly encountered a large, serpent-like creature with four wings. This being transformed into a bird-sized dragonfly and died at its feet. He then preserved the creature's body, adorning it with jewels, and carried it in a satchel everywhere he went, including to the infamous Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. In 1900, however, upon his baptism, he felt compelled to discard the mummified creature, though carving he made of it survived. This carving represents a tangible link to the mysterious creature from his vision quest. Historians like Adrian Mayer and John LeMay have explored the intriguing possibility that the creature Goals had encountered could have been a Meganura or a similar giant griffinfly. Meganura were prehistoric insects from the late Carboniferous period, resembling giant dragonflies with wingspans reaching up to several feet. I would personally be terrified ever seeing something like that. The idea that a Meganura long extinct could have appeared in the 9th century is ultimately a source of fascination and speculation. Dinosaur Bones on the Moon The Dinosaur Bones on the Moon theory is an urban legend of dinosaur bones found on the moon. This legend has taken various forms, with some variants suggesting the discovery of alien or giant humanoid bones by NASA missions, and others claiming the bones were clad in denim. 
The most interesting version involves dinosaur bones, often referred to as lunar cryptosaurs. This particular version of the legend was given a semblance of credibility by the independent Orion Observatory of Santa Monica. In Patrick Moore's book, Can You Speak Venusian? It's mentioned that the observatory published a paper interpreting photographs taken by the Surveyor Lunar Probe as showing the remains of dinosaurs on the moon. While this claim is not supported by mainstream science, it is contributed to the legend's persistence. The idea that dinosaur bones could be on the moon is not entirely without scientific foundation, though it remains highly speculative. Hank Green and other scientists have discussed the possibility that the asteroid impact that caused the KT extinction event might have ejected debris, including dinosaur remains, into space. The moon, with its minimal atmosphere and geological activity, could theoretically preserve such remains. Initial Bipedalism Initial bipedalism is an unconventional theory in the field of evolutionary biology. It posits that all vertebrates are descended from a bipedal, human-like ancestor, a concept that contradicts the well-established scientific understanding of vertebrate evolution. According to this theory, the original ancestor of all vertebrates was a marine homunculus, a creature that evolved directly from marine worms. This organism supposedly adopted a bipedal posture by floating upright in the water, with a buoyant dome at the head end, keeping it afloat and body dangling beneath. Over time, this head bubble is said to have evolved into a skull, with the development of small, feel-like arms and legs. Proponents of this theory suggest that these early humanoids eventually moved onto land, and from these proto-humans, all other vertebrates are believed to have descended, or as the theory suggested, devolved. The theory implies that the transition to a four-legged posture in later vertebrates led to a loss of intellectual capacity inherent in the bipedal ancestors. Fossils are from the future. The idea that fossils might originate from the future is a concept explored in paranormal and conspiracy literature, presenting two intriguing theories. The first theory revolves around the out-of-place artifacts, or ooparts, traditionally cited as the evidence of ancient advanced civilizations or extraterrestrial activities. This perspective suggests these artifacts are not remnants of the past, but rather left behind by time travelers from the future. It proposes that these travelers have visited prehistoric Earth, leaving behind objects or fossils that we found today, thereby reversing the conventional archaeological narrative. What we perceive as ancient might actually be evidence of future human activity. The second theory delves into reverse chronology, a concept popularized by Terence McKenna. It challenges our understanding of time and casualties, suggesting that time flows backward towards the Big Bang, which is actually in the future. In this framework, the fossils discovered today are not relics of past organisms, but precursors of creatures yet to evolve from their current forms. This theory reimagines the fossil record as a window into the future rather than a ledger of the past. These theories are further elaborated in science fiction, notably in Brian Aldiss' novel An Age, where such alternative concepts of time and casualty play a central role, which I'll link down below if anyone is interested in reading. Von Hartmann's Evolutionary Theory Edward von Hartmann, a German philosopher in the tradition of philosophical pessimism, offered a unique interpretation of the Darwinian evolutionary theory in his 1869 work Philosophy of the Unconsciousness. Von Hartmann's perspective on evolution was deeply mixed with his pessimistic philosophy, focusing not on the growth and optimization, but the concept of suffering as a driving force of evolutionary change. According to Von Hartmann, the primary motivation in evolution is not the pursuit of improvement or efficiency, like a plant growing upwards to better capture sunlight, but rather an attempt to escape the inherent suffering of existence. In this model, each evolutionary step, rather than leading to a better state, results in more complex and nuanced forms of suffering. For example, in plants, the growth towards the sun is seen not as a positive development, but as an attempt to escape a fundamental strait of distress. Von Hartmann applied this concept to human evolution as well. He proposed that the development of the human brain and the elaboration of the spinal column into the skull were attempts to escape suffering. However, this evolution only led to heightened awareness of suffering through complex thought. According to Von Hartmann, this awareness of suffering is a source of profound distress. In a radical extension of this theory, Von Hartmann even argued that humans, with their unique ability to recognize the roots of suffering and act in ways not determined by instinct, have the means and even the responsibility to end suffering. He went so far as to suggest that this responsibility extends to all life forms, even those on other planets. In Von Hartmann's view, the ultimate solution to end all suffering would basically be the destruction of the universe, which is pretty dark. Cardiff Giant slash Pelton Man Sightings the concept of sightings of humanoid entities resembling the Pelton Man and the Cardiff Giant ties into a fascinating area of cryptozoology and paranormal theory. British cryptozoologists Nick Redfern and Carl Schucker have compiled accounts of such sightings, which add an intriguing dimension to a study of cryptids and paranormal phenomena. The Pelton Man was a famous paleontological hoax from the early 20th century, which we mentioned in Tier 1, involving fragments of the skull and jaw bone, purported to be the remains of a previously unknown early human. It was later revealed to be a fabrication as we know, combining human skull pieces with an orangutan's jaw. The Cardiff Giant was another well-known hoax, a 10-foot tall purported petrified man found in New York in 1869, which was actually a carved gypsum statue. Redfern and Shucker's collection of stories involving sightings of entities resembling these hoaxes presents an unusual twist in cryptozoological lore. Rather than suggesting these entities are real physical beings, 
Redfern posits that these sightings could be tulpa-like manifestations. A tulpa, a mystical traditions and paranormal theory, is a thought form or a being created through the power of the mind or collective belief. This theory suggests that the entities people report seeing may not actually be prehistoric or undiscovered creatures, but manifestations of what the witnesses expect or believe to see. This idea ties into broader discussions about the power of belief, expectation, and collective consciousness in shaping human experiences of the unexplained. God is a genetically engineered Spinosaurus, Dragonite Chronicle Theories. The Dragonite Chronicle paradigm is an unusual and elaborate theory that emerged from internet message boards blending elements of conspiracy theory, religious interpretation, and science fiction. The central figure behind this theory, known as Dragonic Chronicler, proposed that dragons, far from being mythical creatures, are real entities that have significantly influenced human history and evolution. According to this theory, these dragons are not only real, but are also the beings referred to as God or the Creator in various religious texts around the world. However, the theory proposes that these dragons are not true gods in the traditional sense. Instead, they are likened to demiurges or gatekeepers, serving a higher power. This higher power is described as interdimensional aliens who genetically modified the ancestors of these dragons, specifically Spinosaurus, transferring them into godlike dragon forms. The transformation was part of a transcendental master plan orchestrated by these aliens. The Dragonic Chronicle paradigm is a prime example of how internet culture can give rise to and propagate complex and unconventional theories. Despite its lack of scientific credibility, the theory gained a degree of notoriety and discussion on various online platforms. It represents a fusion of different genres and ideas, from paleontology and theology to ufology and speculative fiction. Fossils of Sun Photographs slash Helium Memory W.J.T. Mitchell, a cultural anthropologist and art theorist, presented a thought-provoking idea connecting the process of fossilization to photography. Drawing on the notion that photographs are fossilized light, Mitchell proposed that fossils could be viewed as Earth's primitive attempts at image preservation. This concept suggests that just as photographs capture and preserve moments in time through light, fossils preserve remnants of the past through geological processes. Mitchell's idea can be seen as metaphorical interpretation of how fossils and photographs serve as mediums for memory and history albeit through vastly different processes and timescales. While likely meant in jest, Mitchell's theory echoes earlier pre-enlightenment ideas about the formation of fossil images. One such belief was the concept of helio memory of solar particles. According to this notion, the sun's rays were thought to have the ability to remember the forms of objects they touch, imprinting these forms onto rocks as fossils. This belief attributed a sort of photographic quality to the sun's rays, suggesting they could capture and preserve images of objects in the natural world. Polar reversal causes mass extinctions. The theory that polar shift causes extinction of dinosaurs is not really widely accepted in the scientific community. Polar shift refers to a sudden change in the relative positions of Earth's north and south poles, which could potentially lead to cataclysmic events. However, there's no concrete evidence to support the occurrence of rapid polar shifts in Earth's history. Instead, polar wander has been observed, which is a slow, gradual shift of the poles over millions of years. A related concept with more scientific backing is that of geomagnetic reversal, where the positions of magnetic north and south suddenly flip. Some researchers have suggested that these reversals could be linked to extinction events, but evidence for this has been elusive. A study led by Yang Wei of the Chinese Academy of Sciences suggested that the geomagnetic reversals could have played a role in the Triassic Jurassic mass extinction 200 million years ago, where up to 84% of all species on Earth perished. The team concluded that geomagnetic reversals could have stripped a significant amount of oxygen from the atmosphere, contributing to extinction. However, the US Geological Survey states that there is no evidence of a correlation between mass extinctions and magnetic pole reversals. Another study reported a large and fast true polar wander TPW, event that occurred 450 to 440 million years ago, which could have triggered severe glaciation and mass extinction. However, this event predates the extinction of the dinosaurs, which occurred around 65 million years ago. Fetalization The concept of fetalization, as proposed by Dutch anatomist Louis Bolk, refers to the idea that humans exhibit juvenile or infantile characteristics well into their adulthood. Bulk's observation was that humans retain certain physical traits and features that are typically associated with the juvenile stage of development in other primates. He saw this as an evolutionary advantage and suggests that humans are essentially fetal apes who are born prematurely compared to other primates. Bulk's theory is closely related to the concept of neoteny, which is the retention of juvenile traits into adulthood in a species. In the case of humans, Bulk believed that our overactive endocrine glands responsible for the secretion of hormones play a role in keeping us in a prolonged state of immaturity compared to other primates. This concept of fetalization has contributed to the understanding of human evolution and development. It suggests that our extended period of growth and development, including a longer period of childhood and adolescence, may have provided advantages in terms of learning, adaptability, and socialization, ultimately contributing to our success as a species. Typhostrophism Otto H. Swindewolf, a prominent German paleontologist, proposed the theory of typhostrophism, 
which posits that evolutionary occurs due to periodic cyclic motion of evolutionary processes that are predestined to go through a life cycle dictated by factors internal to the organism. This theory is a modification of Bolt's theory and is also known as proterogenesis. His theory essentially suggests that all macroevolution is eternally directed through this life cycle process. He proposed that new types of organisms occur in sudden leaps, a concept known as saltationism, which we introduced before. According to this theory, all the traits of a new type of animal would emerge in a fetal version and an original immune, individual of a pre-existing type, such as a bird born of a lizard egg. These traits would then not further evolve, but would be simply reorganized through subsequent speciation. Swindoll's theory is divided into three stages, typogenesis, typostatus, and type losses. Typogenesis refers to an explosion of new species, typostatus refers to a maintenance of these types, and type losses refers to a splitting of types or degeneration. However, his theory has not really been accepted in the scientific community. Kirks argued that theory lacks a genetic explanation for the saltinational phenomena it describes. Also, the theory is considered non-sectionalistness and saltational, which contrasts with the modern synthesis of evolutionary thought that is dominated by natural selection. Despite these criticisms, Sindelwolf's theory has drawn attention to fundamental problems of evolution and has influenced the field of paleontology. Sacral Skull The concept of the sacral skull is an intriguing historical idea in the field of anatomy and paleontology. Lorenz Oaken, an 18th century naturalist philosopher, proposed the theory that the skull is essentially an extension of the spine. According to Oaken, both the skull and the sacral pelvic bones developed from the growth of a vertebral column, originating from a central point where the structures were originally fused. This idea was later revived and modified by Richard Owen, a prominent 19th century biologist and paleontologist. Owen incorporated this concept into his archetype theory of vertebrae homology, where he sought to establish common structural patterns among different vertebrate species. In the realm of paleontology, the notion of a sacral bane or Pistoria brain case was applied to certain large dinosaurs, such as Psychosaurus by O.C. Marsh. This concept suggests that these dinosaurs had a concentration of neural tissue in their pelvic region, which was connected to their spinal cord. Interestingly, in 1914, German paleontologist Wilhelm von Branca proposed that humans retained a vestigial remnant of the sacral bane in the form of solar plexus nerve clusters. Basically, the solar plexus is a complex network of nerves located in the abdomen, and von Branca says that it might have evolutionary connection to the sacral brain seen in certain dinosaurs. Dromaeosaurus as parasites The theory that Dromaeosaurus, a group of theropod dinosaurs, were parasites is a hypothesis proposed by Garnet Fraser in a 2014 paper titled Bizarre Structures Point to Dromaeosaurus as Parasites and a New Theory for the Origin of Avian Flight. According to this theory, Dromaeosaurus were opportunistic parasites that would climb onto the backs of large herbivores, hold on tight, feed, and then dismount. Fraser suggests that the bizarre structures seen in many dinosaur species, such as Ceratopsia on neck frills, Lambiosaurine's crest, Hadrosaurus scales, Stegosaurus plates, and others, may have served to defend against these parasitic dorsal attacks from riding Dromaeosaurus. He also proposed that the frequent dismounts of large living dinosaurs may explain the origin of feathers, gliding, and avian flights. However, this theory has not really been accepted. Critics argue that the theory lacks a genetic explanation for the parasitic behavior it describes. Also, the theory is considered speculative and is not supported by substantial fossil evidence. Despite these criticisms though, Fraser's theory has drawn attention to the potential for diverse feeding strategies in Dromaeosaurus and other theropod dinosaurs. Alright, on to tier 7, Neanderthal Deep State slash Germatism. Stanislaw Suzukowski, a Polish artist known for his diverse work encompassing writing, illustration, and sculpture, would develop a unique and controversial conspiracy theory known as Zermatism. This theory posits that Neanderthals, which are referred to as Yetis, have subjugated Homo sapiens since the Paleolithic era and continue to exert control over humanity. According to Suzlowski, the descendants of ancient human Neanderthal interbreeding form a ruling class that governs the world in plain sight. Zermatism is an extreme example of the deep state trope extending the concept of hidden power structures into the deep past of human history. However, it's crucial to note that Sulaski's theory was deeply rooted in racism and anti-Semitism. He basically employed a variety form of phrenology, a debunked and discriminatory pseudoscience, to identify supposed Neanderthal bloodlines among human populations. These ideas end up finding resonance in some occult and conspiracy literature. For example, British author Colin Wilson in his book Mysteries controversially echoed these notions. Wilson claimed that Jewish people are a magical race, with their supposed magic deriving from a high degree of Neanderthal ancestry. Such claims perpetuate harmful stereotypes and unfounded scientific theories. Soviet Abiogenesis 1972 The Soviet Abiogenesis theory refers to a claim surrounding the so-called Tudinov affair of 1972. This theory revolves around an alleged experiment in which Soviet scientists supposedly revived 250 million year old worms and algae from mineral deposits in the Ural Mountains. The theory proposes that this event was not merely a case of reviving ancient life, was a successful demonstration of abiogenesis, which is a spontaneous generation of complex synthetic life. Abiogenesis, in a scientific context, 
usually refers to the natural process by which life arises from non-living matter, such as simple organic compounds. However, the revival of an ancient, complex organisms like worm and algae from a dormant or fossilized state would not typically be classified under abiogenesis. Instead, it would represent an extraordinary case of biological resurrection or survival. The credibility of true novel fear is highly questionable. There is a lack of follow-up reports or peer-reviewed scientific publications to substantiate the claims made in the initial report. The absence of corroborating evidence and the science that followed the initial announcement have led to many doubt whether the experiment took place at all. Dinosaur Psychic Warfare The concept of dinosaurs engaging in psychic warfare as the cause for the extinction is an imaginative and unconventional idea, originating from a personal account of hallucinatory experiences shared by an aeroid user named Datorodactyl. In this 2012 report, the user describes a Datora-induced hallucination in which they visualize the history of the universe through patterns in fallen leaves during a rainstorm. According to his account, the hallucination revealed that dinosaurs were part of a morphic field, a concept in which members of a species are connected to a shared collective consciousness. In this vision, the dinosaurs were not only psychically linked, but also engaged in psychic battles with each other. The user narrated that these psychic conflicts became so intense and competitive that they ultimately led to the destruction of the morphic field, resulting in the extinction of the dinosaurs. Morphic Fields of Dinosaurs Rupert Sheldick's Morphic Resonance Theory, also known as Morphic Field Theory, is a hypothesis that proposes a form of natural telepathy or collective unconsciousness connecting all living things. Kind of adds on to the last entry, but this concept, while not widely accepted in the mainstream scientific community, offers a unique perspective on biological and ecological interconnections. In his 1980 book, The Presence of the Past, Sheldrake explores the idea of morphic fields as a kind of collective memory for species. He raises the question of what happens to the morphic fields of extinct species like dinosaurs. According to this theory, the morphic fields of dinosaurs still exist in some form, but lack a physical medium or tuning system to manifest. In the case of dinosaurs, this would be something like a living dinosaur egg that could resonate with the dinosaur morphic field. Sheldrick suggests that through a process of atavism, sometimes referred to as de-evolution, it might be possible for a creature to be born that could tune into the morphic frequency of the dinosaurs. This creature, by resonating with the dinosaur morphic field, could potentially lead to the reappearance of dinosaur-like traits or behaviors. Cats Evolved from Theropod Dinosaurs W. H. Ballou's 1920 article, Science Finds the Father of the Cat, presents an unconventional and scientifically unsupported theory about the evolution of cats. In this article, Ballou claimed that Ceratosaurus, a genus of large theropod dinosaurs, was a direct ancestor of modern cats. Accompanying this claim was a striking reconstruction of an 18-foot tabby cat towering over a human, meant to illustrate the supposed evolutionary connection. Ceratosaurus, a carnivorous dinosaur from the late Jurassic period, was indeed a theropod, but there is no scientific evidence to support the idea that it was directly related to modern felines. Theropods are more commonly accepted as the ancestor of birds, not mammals like cats. The evolutionary lineage of cats, as understood by contemporary science, traces back to early mammalian ancestors that were small, nocturnal creatures living in the shadow of the dinosaurs, not dinosaurs themselves. Ballou's theory reflects the early 20th century fascination with, and sometimes speculative approach to paleontology and evolution in biology. During this time, the field was still developing, and many ideas that were proposed lack rigorous standards of evidence and testing that are commonplace in modern scientific practice. Stegosaurus could fly. The claim that Stegosaurus could fly by flapping its back plates, as proposed by W. H. Ballou in an article for the Ogden Standard Examiner, is a striking example of early 20th century scientific speculation that strays far from modern paleontologic understanding. Although it does sound really interesting, I'll be honest. Ballou, known for his writing in both the Ogden Standard Examiner and Scientific American, shows that the large bony plates along the back of the Stegosaurus function as wings, enabling the dinosaur to fly. This idea, however, is completely unfounded in scientific evidence and contradicts what is known about Stegosaurus and its physical capabilities. Stegosaurus was a large, heavily built herbivorous dinosaur from the late Jurassic period, characterized by a distinctive rope of spinal plates and spiked tail. These plates, far from being aerodynamic structures, are believed to have served functions such as thermoregulation, display, or defense. The notion of a massive, ground dwelling dinosaur like Stegosaurus taking flight by flapping his back plates defies basic principles of anatomy, physics, and biology. Not only would the size and weight of Stegosaurus make flight impossible, but its place also lacked any structure or musculature that would enable flapping or any form of powered flight. While Ballard's idea never gained acceptance in a scientific community, it did find a place in popular culture, notably in the Tarzan and Pellucidor novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs. In these fictional works, the imaginary concept of a flying Stegosaurus adds to the adventure and fantasy elements of the stories. Baby Pterodactyls on the Black Market the urban legend or conspiracy theories about baby pterodactyls being sold on the black market is a fictional concept, seemingly originating from the realm of internet-based speculative fiction, particularly the SCP Foundation universe. The story, titled SCP-346 in the SCP Secure Contain Protect series, which is a collaborative fictional project, 
features a creature resembling a baby pterodactyl. In this SCP narrative, various anomalous entities, objects, and phenomena are catalogued and contained by the fictional SCP Foundation. SCP-346, specifically, refers to a small pterosaur-like creature that is kept and studied within the Foundation's facilities. The SCP series is known for its creative and often eerie fictional entries, blending elements of horror, science fiction, and urban legends. The notion of baby pterodactyls being traded on the black market has no basis in reality. Pterodactyls, or more accurately pterosaurs, were flying reptiles that lived during the time of the dinosaurs and went extinct around 66 million years ago. There's no scientific evidence to suggest that they have survived in the modern era or that living specimens could be available for trade. Fossils are sculptures made by a lost civilization. In the early modern period, when the understanding of fossils was still developing, various intriguing theories were proposed to explain their origins. Once this theory came from a French quarryman, as documented in Robert de Paul de Laminon's 1782 work on fossils. During this time, the distinction between organic fossils and other mineral forms, such as crystals, was not yet clearly established. The quarryman provided Laminon with a selection of fossils, including a modern looking key. He theorized that all these fossils, even those resembling animals, were actually sculptures and carvings created by an ancient civilization. This idea suggests that rather being remnants of past life forms, fossils were artistic creations of a lost, sophisticated society. Laminon, while intrigued by this notion, disagreed with the idea that could explain the appearance of fossilized animals. He observed that these seemed too naturalistic and detailed to be human-made artifacts. M.J. Rudwick, a historian of science, later suggested that the collection given to Laminon and fabricated or composite pieces created by the quarryman himself. The quarryman's theory gained some attention, partly because it aligned with the then popular belief that humans had existed since the creation of the Earth. A similar hypothesis was proposed by Johann Bringer, known for the Bringer Stones hoax. Bringer initially believed that the carved stones he found were genuine fossils, but later concluded that they were not the work of ancient pagans, especially after finding stones with Hebrew inscriptions bearing the name of God. Birds evolved from flying fish. In Taohai's 1993 publication, some new discoveries about the groups of paleoecological geography of Zhi Hong and the study of them presents a controversial and unconventional theory about the evolution of birds. In this work, Taohai described a fossil that he interpreted as a transitional species between a fish and a bird. This fossil, according to Taohai, possessed a fin-like wing suggesting an evolutionary pathway where the gilding leaps in fish gradually led to the development of powered flight in birds. He also speculated that fish scales might have evolved into feathers over time. The series stands in stark contrast to a widely accepted scientific consensus that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs, a group of bipedal, mostly carnivorous dinosaurs. The transition from theropod dinosaurs to birds is well documented and supported by substantial fossil record, including iconic transitional fossils like Archaeopteryx. Taohai's interpretation of the fossil as a link between fish and birds is unique, but has not been widely accepted in the paleontological community. Other paleontologists have critiqued his interpretation, suggesting that the fossil in question was a regular fish that had been distorted by decomposition. Decomposition can significantly alter the appearance of fossilized remains, sometimes leading to the misinterpretations of the original form and structure of the organism. Human Intelligence Evolved from Brain Eating Cult The beginning was the end by Oscar Misk Mirth presents a highly unconventional and controversial thesis regarding the evolution of human intelligence. Mirth's central claim is that human intelligence did not evolve through natural selection or environmental adaption, but rather as a result from ritualistic cannibalistic practices, specifically the consumption of human brains. According to Mirth, over several thousand years, a brain-eating cult among early humans led to an increase in intelligence and virility. He posits that consuming the brains of fellow humans resulted in a significant alteration of the brain's development and functioning in those who practiced this cannibalism. Merth also claims that this dietary practice had a detrimental effect on innate telepathic abilities, suggesting that early humans were telepathic before engaging in these rituals. Merth's ideas, however, are not supported by credible scientific evidence or accepted theories of human evolution. Even though it sounds really interesting, the scientific consensus holds that human intelligence evolved due to a complex interplay of genetic, environmental, and social factors. This includes changes in brain size and structure, the development of language and tool use, and the ability to adapt to diverse and changing environments. Also, the claim that eating human brains increases intelligence contradicts established knowledge about prion diseases, such as Kuru, which are linked to brain degeneration and are known to have been transmitted through cannibalistic practices. Alright, we're now into the last tier, Tier A. Dinosaurs were mammals, Velikovsky. Emanuel Velikovsky, known for his controversial works like Worlds in Collision, proposed a highly unconventional theory about dinosaurs in his 1978 article, Brontosaurus was a mammal, for Cronus Magazine. Velikovsky's theory diverged significantly from accepted scientific understanding by suggesting that dinosaurs were not reptiles but mammals, specifically resembling egg-laying monotremes. Monotremes such as platypus and echidna are a unique group of mammals known for laying eggs rather than giving birth to live young, a characteristic shared with reptiles and birds. 
Belikovsky theory posited that dinosaurs like mind dreams were egg-laying mammals and that some of these dinosaurian mammals eventually evolved into the modern mammals we see today. However, Velikovsky's reconstruction of dinosaurs as mammals is not supported by paleontological evidence. The scientific consensus, based on extensive fossil records and advanced research techniques, classifies dinosaurs as a diverse group of reptiles. This classification is supported by numerous anatomical and psychological features found in dinosaur fossils, including characteristics of the skeletal structure, reproductive methods, and metabolic processes. Also, the evolutionary lineage from dinosaurs to modern birds is well documented, with birds being the only surviving lineage of theropod dinosaurs. The transition from non-even dinosaurs to birds is evidenced by a plethora of transitional fossils, such as Archaeopteryx, which we mentioned a lot, which demonstrate a gradual accumulation of avian features over time. Spinosaurus was bombed by the Allies deliberately. The conspiracy theory suggesting that the Allied bombing of Minutia's paleontological museum in 1944 was a deliberate attempt to destroy Spinosaurus fossils is a rare and speculative claim with no substantial evidence to support it. The theory posits that the Allies, aware of the significance of Spinosaurus as the largest known theropod dinosaur, aim to liberate the fossils to prevent the Axis powers from boasting the possession of the biggest and most impressive dinosaur specimens. In reality though, the bombing of Munich, including the Paleontological Museum, was part of the broader Allied strategy during World War II to target German cities and industrial centers. The loss of the Spinosaurus fossils, along with many other valuable scientific specimens, was a tragic consequence of the widespread destruction during the war, rather than a targeted effort. The theory reflects a blend of historical evidence and imaginative speculation, characteristic of many conspiracy theories. It suggests a patriotic or nationalistic motive behind scientific endeavors, projecting a competition for paleontological prestige onto the wartime context. However, this perspective overlooks the more likely reality that the destruction of cultural and scientific heritage, such as museum collections, was an unfortunate byproduct of the bar military objectives and the chaotic nature of war. Alright, now onto the last final entry Gog Magog are dancers. The fringe theory interpreting Gog Magog, Yajuj, and Majuj in Quranic texts as dinosaurs is a unique combination of religious astrology and paleontological speculation. In traditional Islamic astrology, Gog and Magog are often depicted as primordial tribes or demonic forces that will play a significant role in the events leading to the ultimate apocalypse. The Quran describes them as being contained behind a massive barrier, which, when destroyed, will unleash them upon the world, leading to cataclysmic events. This fringe theory diverges significantly from mainstream interpretation, suggesting that Gog and Magog are not tribes or demonic entities, but rather dinosaurs that have been contained within the earth similar to the Greek Titans. According to proponents of the theory, like Rumen Reza, these demonic dinosaurs are separated by Telluric Force, located at the equator, and ancient megaliths and structures, such as the Great Wall of China, were constructed to keep them maintained. Mohammed Alam Din Askiri extended this theory by suggesting that these dinosaurs currently exist in the form of eggs in deep pits, waiting for the right conditions to emerge. The overlap of the names Gog and Magog with the British giant legend of Gog Magog, which has sometimes been associated with fossil bones, might have contributed to the development of this fringe theory. In some British folklore, Gog Magog refers to a giant or giants, and fossil bones discovered in the past were occasionally attributed to such mythical beings due to the lack of scientific understanding of paleontology at the time. Alright, so that concludes the end of the video. It was a really awesome series, I really had fun making this and I learned a lot, and I hope you liked it too. Because you're commenting, like feedback or anything, it would help the video out, like liking the video and stuff. And anyways, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good day. Bye.